cannot emphasize enough. Time has run out for some nearly extinct species. There are many groups and individuals who have enabled us to be here today. We're grateful to all of them. We're deeply honored by the dedication and commitment of the members of the accountability panel, all of whom are amongst the most respected in their fields, trusted by all to serve the interests of justice. I will now turn the floor over to Rida Fakri, the Director of Proceedings for this public hearing, who will moderate the two days and introduce the members of the accountability panel. Rida Fakri is an international broadcast journalist and former senior news and pro programs presenter for Al Jazeera English. She has extensive experience as lead anchor, political correspondent, UN diplomatic correspondent, columnist, and bureau chief for a multiple of international news organizations. She is an extremely skilled moderator, and we are fortunate to have her participation in this public hearing. Rida, with many thanks for all your efforts, I turn the floor to you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Olivia, for these very kind words of introduction. It is a, a great pleasure to be here today with all of you. It is also my distinct privilege to serve as Director of Proceedings for this the Wildlife Justice Commission's first ever public hearing. I'd like to thank uh, WJC, of course, for this honor and welcome you all once again. Now, although purely symbolic, it is particularly fitting that we meet here today at the Peace Palace in The Hague, which is known the world over as the seat of the International Court of Justice. But perhaps, let me also say from the very outset that this is not a court, these hearings are not judicial hearings. They're not in any way connected to the work of the ICJ. Instead, as you just heard the executive director say, these public hearings have been called for by a relatively new, small, non-government organization based here in The Hague, the Wildlife Justice Commission, which was established relatively recently, just in 2015, by a group of international lawyers and legal experts, uh, academics as well, to try to disrupt wildlife criminal networks operating around the world, largely with impunity, and try to push the issue onto the world agenda to put pressure on governments and national law enforcement agencies to tackle this issue, to take it seriously, and to act on the body of evidence that is presented to them through the investigations that the WJC undertakes. So the aim of this public hearing is not to put Vietnam on trial, yet somehow the sheer symbolic significance of where we are today, in my view, indicates the seriousness of the crimes we will be discussing and debating over the next two days, poaching and trafficking in wildlife, in endangered species, as Olivia Swag Goldman just mentioned, crimes essentially that have not risen in the consciousness of public opinions or in the minds of governments and national authorities to the level of other serious crimes. Somehow wildlife-related criminal activity is largely perceived as a soft crime, and yet when poaching does endanger a species that may become extinct, I believe it does highlight the gravity of such crimes. Just imagine if you could a world, for instance, without elephants, without rhinos, without tigers or whales, something that seems almost uh, unimaginable, but precisely the kind of scenario that many experts, some of whom are with us here today, have been warning about for many years. And when poaching alters the fragile ecosystems, when it threatens to deprive us, humanity, of a certain species forever, I think then, and I wonder, if such crimes do not rise to the level of other serious crimes, perhaps even crimes against humanity, however crazy and strange that notion might seem, and certainly whether they shouldn't be treated as seriously as the war on drugs, for instance, and all the resources that is um, used in that endeavor. So, so what are we hoping to achieve here 
in the next day or two in this public hearing, and how will we go about it? As the Executive Director of the Wildlife Justice Commission just mentioned, this public hearing is the culmination of many months of behind-the-scenes intensive uh, diplomatic uh, uh, discussions that were launched to begin with in a spirit of cooperation and that still retain to a very large extent that spirit of, it, of, uh, of cooperation if, even though we are here at this public hearing. And it was done to get the authorities in Vietnam to act on a rather large and impressive body of evidence that was presented to them in January of this year. These efforts involved, as you heard, diplomatic channels, but they did not produce the kind of satisfactory results that the Commission was hoping for, and this is why we are gathering here today, and this is why this issue has been pushed onto the global agenda in this public hearing. The aim of this hearing, let me just say, is to allow the public, all of us, and those watching us via uh, a live web stream as well, but first and foremost, it is to allow the accountability panel, and five of their distinguished members are with us here today, it is to allow them to examine the body of evidence, and let me just say as well that they have received the map of uh, facts, as we call it, the evidence that uh, WJC has put together. They received it two months ago, but today they will be here with us on stage and they will be listening to the presentation that will be put uh, forward by the Chief of Investigations. And at the end of the two days, we hope they will come to conclusions, to findings, to recommendations that will then enable the Commission to determine what the best uh, steps might be to try to get the authorities to act and prosecute uh, uh, these crimes in a satisfactory way. Um, let me say also that during the course of this two-day hearing, we'll be taking a close look at all the evidence that form the basis of the case, evidence that exposes the way transnational criminal networks operate largely with impunity. We'll be looking at some key suspects in the illegal trade of wildlife products centered in and around the village of Nikkei, which is just some 17 kilometers south of the Vietnamese uh, capital, Hanoi. The five distinguished members of the accountability panel who are here with us and who represent uh, some of the best legal minds, legal uh, scholars, academics, uh, journalists, and they also come from different parts of the world, they will have that ultimate response responsibility to study the evidence, evidence presented to them and to share their findings and recommendations with all of us. So as I said earlier, this will allow the Commission then to determine what the best course of action might be in trying to ensure that the competent Vietnamese authorities act on what it believes is a highly detailed investigation and evidence of criminal acts which, in its view, should be prosecuted. So today, the Chief of Investigations of the Wildlife Justice Commission will lay the foundation for this case with a framework presentation of the map of facts, summarizing the investigation, and also calling on witnesses and experts, investigators, to tell us in detail what they have seen over this 12-month uh, period, which is how long the investigation into the um, criminal or alleged criminal activities in, in uh, Nikkei in Vietnam were taking place. We'll also seek to show what steps the Vietnamese authorities have taken to address wildlife-related criminal activity. As I said earlier, this isn't a trial. It is not a mock trial either. It's an opportunity for the accountability panel and for all of us, the public, to look at the fact-based evidence to ensure that the perpetrators of these crimes, transnational, organized criminal networks, increasingly sophisticated, are prosecuted by the authorities in Vietnam and elsewhere, and jurisdictional competencies over such crimes, those countries that have those, and in some instances, encourage governments to enact legislation to prosecute crimes when existing legislation is deficient in respect of wildlife criminal related uh, activities as well. So this public, the hearing will set to do all of this, we hope. It is also not intended to be one-sided, I should say. Vietnam was formally invited to participate and participate fully in this hearing. The Vietnamese government, however, elected to send an observer to this hearing, but not to formally participate. So I'd like to extend a, a warm welcome to the observer and also a warm welcome to uh, the Vietnamese people who may be watching us today and following these proceedings uh, through the webcast that is taking place. We'll do our best to fully represent all the evidence the investigation has found and the measures the Vietnamese authorities have 
or haven't taken in connection with this investigation. Now perhaps just a few housekeeping notes before I introduce the accountability panel members and invite them to join me on stage. This public hearing, as you know, was intended to reach as wide a global audience as possible. So we have representatives from international networks who are here following this public hearing. We have camera crews uh, here as well. We have uh, a couple of uh, camera poles just at the exit, at the entrance to this hall, and we encourage everyone to perhaps stop by at some point and uh, leave comments about this public hearing and the work of the Wildlife Justice Commission. Interpreters will be providing simultaneous translation into Vietnamese throughout the, these uh, hearings. You can get translation devices if you need. Uh, they're just uh, here at the back of the hall. The interpreters would also greatly appreciate, I'm told, if we could all speak at normal speed, perhaps, uh, and preferably also speak a little slower than we normally do. So I apologize in advance if I need to interrupt anyone for going too fast, and I know that I will constantly need to remind myself as well of the need to slow down. Now, uh, for any interview requests as well, I should just say that uh, there is a media team here to assist. And of course, all those of you who use social media, please do. It's important to get the word out, to amplify the message as much as we can, and to spread the word about what is taking place here over the course of the next two days. So if you tweet, do send us your comments, your tweets and questions on Twitter. It would be helpful if you could always use the public hearing hashtags in your posts, as you see there, hashtag WJC Vietnam. And we will do our best to share these comments and questions in our public discussion tomorrow. You can also submit comments and questions at the information desk before 9 a.m. or during the lunch break, so before 9 a.m. tomorrow, before the start of our second day, members of the audience can make any comments they want and we will do our best to share them here with the audience. We're also very much looking forward to a discussion with interested parties, representatives from NGOs, that will take place tomorrow as well. But first things first, let's focus on today's proceedings. Today we will lay the foundations, as I said, for the case and we will focus on the presentation of the map of facts tomorrow we will bring in views from interested parties in the morning and the wider public in the afternoon. So today the Chief of Investigations will present key findings and will ask experts to elaborate further on the evidence. I will have the opportunity to ask any questions of clarification, so will the accountability panel members who will be on stage in a few moments and who were selected by the Commission on the basis of their impartiality and outstanding credentials. I should also just quickly mention that the map of facts has been reviewed by two members of the accountability panel before it was sent to the relevant authorities in Vietnam. The panel, though, is represented here by five of its members. None of them are among the reviewers, but they've all had the map of facts for two months now. And it is my pleasure to introduce them and ask them to take their seat here on stage. Let me begin with uh, Justice Philippe Kirsch, if I may. Uh, Mr. Kirsch is a prominent judge. May I ask you to please join me on stage, Mr. Kirsch. Uh, who, he is a prominent uh, judge and diplomat. Many of you are familiar with him. He has had a very distinguished career with the Canadian Foreign Service. He was the first president of the International Court, the International Criminal Court, the ICC, between 2003 and 2009. And he, of course, played a pivotal role in the negotiations uh, of the Rome Statute, which led to the establishment of the ICC. May I also call on Justice uh, Diego Garcia Sayan, who was president of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights between 2010 and 2013, and uh, is a justice on the court, was a justice on the court from 2004 to 2015. He's also a former Minister of Foreign Affairs and a former Justice Minister of Peru. Justice Isaac Leneola was appointed just last week, in fact, as a judge on the Supreme Court of Kenya. Congratulations. Prior to that, Justice Leneola was the presiding judge of the Constitution and Human Rights Division of the High Court of Kenya. He's also deputy principal judge of the East African Court of Justice. Professor Edgardo Buscaglia is a distinguished research scholar in law and economics at Columbia University in New York City. He's also president of the Citizens Action Institute, which is a Mexican civil 
society organization aimed at establishing international networks for rescuing and protecting victims of transnational organized crime. And uh, last but certainly not least, Misha Glenny is an award-winning British journalist, historian, and author who specializes in organized crime and cybersecurity. His best-selling book, Mac Mafia, looks at organized crime around the world and was translated into more than 30 languages. He's also a former BBC correspondent. Uh, it's an honor to have you all here at the public hearing. I think your presence is testimony to the importance, the innovative role that uh, this public hearing and the World Wildlife Justice Commission can hopefully play in holding countries and governments and law enforcement agencies to account when it comes to the commission of wildlife and wildlife-related crimes. Your willingness to be part of the accountability panel in and of itself, I think, indicates the importance you attach to this issue. And for that, as Director of Proceedings and on behalf of the Wildlife Justice Commission, I'd like to express our sincere gratitude. Now, we look forward to the findings that will emerge from this hearing to inform and support relevant authorities in addressing the issues we mentioned, and also to sensitize the public and authorities alike that such crimes have to be taken more seriously and have to be prosecuted. And although, as you can see, there's a slight gender imbalance, uh, let me just reassure everyone that uh, it by no means reflects the membership of the accountability panel as a whole. We have uh, within the accountability panel, but unfortunately not here with us today, a number of eminent uh, women jurists and legal experts. And now before we begin with the official proceedings, it is my pleasure to invite our first uh, distinguished speaker, Judge Motu Noguchi, to join me here on stage to, to discuss the need to fight against impunity in tackling wildlife-related crimes, Judge uh, Motu Noguchi is chair of the board of directors of the Trust Fund for Victims at the International Criminal Court. He's a former international judge at the Supreme Court Chamber of the Extraordinary Chambers and the Courts of Cambodia, in short form, the uh, so-called Khmer Rouge trials. He's also an advisory council member of the Wildlife Justice Commission. Judge uh, Noguchi, um, clearly you have extensive experience in taking on some cases where you have tried to bring justice to people who have suffered some of the most serious kinds of human rights violations. You've dealt with massacres of fellow human beings, war crimes. Compared to such crimes, wildlife trafficking appears almost, almost trivial, almost secondary. And yet, you are here at this public hearing. What motivated you to be part of this? Uh, as we all know, <coughs> as we all know, large-scale transnational crimes are prevalent in many different areas. And crimes against uh, wildlife are one of the most outstanding examples. And despite warnings and cries, these crimes continue to be prevalent uh, and increase uh, both in number and on, on scale. And the culture of impunity uh, prevails. So in, in this regard, uh, compared to other so-called serious, most serious international crimes, uh, there is uh, equivalent uh, significance to uh, tackle the culture of impunity in this particular area of uh, crimes. That, that's what I uh, got interested in joining this uh, endeavor. How important, though, is it to strengthen the rule of law, international and national legislation, to prosecute wildlife-related crimes? Do we have the kinds of robust uh, pieces of le legislation that we need? Is it just an issue of implementation? Or does it go deeper than that? Uh, to my knowledge, most of uh, national sovereign uh, countries have its own uh, domestic laws prohibiting and punishing uh, wildlife-related crimes uh, or uh, poaching, uh, trafficking uh, of these uh, crimes. What is most lacking is, of course, uh, enforcement. Uh, 
and this is uh, based on the absence of necessarily political will. Uh, so it, it seems that uh, it is high time to provide uh, functioning mechanisms to encourage uh, the law enforcement authorities of, of the relevant uh, government to take concrete action. We are not yet, uh, already not uh, at the stage of yeah. talking about uh, what uh, necessary laws are. You say we're not there yet. You mentioned the fact that political will is deficient. Some people might also argue that it's a question perhaps as well of uh, resources. Uh, but also, to what extent, in order to implement the laws that are already in place, to what extent is it important to mobilize public opinion behind such uh, campaigns? Because, as I said earlier, in the perce perception of many people, Trafficking in animal products is simply not seen as a major crime. Some might even wonder why you would focus so much on this when there are more pressing human rights violations around the world that might require more of the world's attention. Why should it matter so much to stop wildlife crime? And how clearly, in your view, does it affect other transnational organized crimes if left unchecked? The wildlife uh, crimes uh, are one of the most uh, outstanding criminal uh, crimes uh, in terms of the amount of illegal profit. And uh, it is also uh, a source of uh, uh, other uh, illegal criminal uh, networks, including corruption, as uh, was mentioned earlier today, uh, or uh, money laundering or even the conduit to, uh, the conduit to traffic uh, of human, uh, human trafficking or drug trafficking. It uh, simply is a part, core part of the uh, global or uh, international organized criminal networks. And it is a, one of the source of the biggest profits. So, Tackling wildlife crime itself is, of course, important, but it's also important to, uh, for the purposes of tackling other crimes of the similar uh, scales and magnitude. But how do you go after the people who really matter? We heard earlier uh, the executive director of the commission mention the fact that quite often it is the so-called small guy, the poachers, who are uh, caught, but uh, people, with, um, people in the higher echelons of government or law enforcement agencies are the ones who are so well connected, so powerful, have such a far-reaching network of connections that they very much feel protected and immune to prosecution. How do you even begin to tackle that aspect of it? Uh, again, here the issue is uh, uh, the political will. Uh, we are not talking about the uh, alternative uh, method of uh, prosecution. As was the case, as in the case of the International Criminal Court, for example, mm -hmm. they have its own investigation, prosecution, and uh, trials. But uh, the Wildlife Justice Commission is taking a very uh, innovative approach in encouraging the relevant authorities of the government to take uh, necessary action in terms of uh, investigation, prosecution, and uh, punishment. But but could this approach somehow? Uh, also have um, unintended negative consequences in that the naming of shaming of certain countries in such a public setting could have those unintended negative consequences? Or does it, for you, from the perspective of international criminal justice, actually serve as, a, as an important positive mechanism? Yeah, I'd like to wait on the positive side. Uh, having seen or having involved in the international criminal tribunals, uh, for some time, it simply uh, takes too much time and too, too much uh, cost sometimes, uh, even in dealing with the most serious international crimes. And uh, the international community is not in a position to fund for the establishment of yet another similar mechanism for or yet another type of crimes. Uh, so the Wildlife Justice Commission is very uh, innovative uh, institution in that 
it doesn't require uh, millions of dollars of, uh, of uh, funding to be establishing establishment and uh, to be maintained, or it doesn't have uh, uh, hundreds of staff to operate. Uh, instead, it is a uh, non-profit organization uh, funded by a relatively modest cost, uh, fund, and uh, it is composed of a uh, uh, very small number of uh, staff, also dedicated and uh, uh, professional. So once this kind of mechanism uh, functions, in, in my view, it could provide a very a tremendous potential uh, to the uh, functioning of international criminal justice. It is indeed a new approach. And I wonder how much uh, we could learn from uh, what has taken place over the last few years in your own country, Japan, uh, when there's so much talk about uh, the continuing, perhaps even increasing demand uh, within Asia uh, in li wildlife animal products. Your own country, Japan, was a leading market for rhino horn back in the 1970s. Then in 1980, Japan ratified the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, uh, CITES. Demand reduction strategies seem to have worked in Japan. What, what were the main planks of that strategy? And are we likely to see something similar in Vietnam? And if not, would it be a lack of capacity, as you said earlier, a lack of uh, political will, uh, government priority, perhaps, or, or something else? Yeah, I, I think it's a combination of the political will and uh, uh, supplementary provision of the uh, technical capacity. In terms of the technical capacity of investigation and prosecution, the international community could assist. Uh, however, the political will must uh, come from the government itself. And uh, uh, the continuous and sometimes uh, uh, painful uh, outreach activities is necessary uh, to remind the government of the seriousness of the uh, issue. And, and of course, uh, in case of Japan, uh, many years of uh, continuous outreach uh, has uh, produced a tangible result, I think. Uh, just finally, finally Judge uh, Moto, before I let you go, just uh, a sense from you on how much of a milestone you think this uh, public hearing will represent and how important its role will be in the overall scheme of things. I think this public hearing, uh, for the first time in at the Wildlife Justice Commission's public action it is really important. Uh, uh, this is uh, not only to uh, provide evidence uh, in public, but also uh, to uh, invite the international community to take serious interest in the, in the uh, issues. And uh, I hope that you are all here uh, not to uh, be observers, uh, but to participate in the proceedings. Uh, this is what uh, actually the uh, World Justice, Justice Commission is intending. Uh, its proceedings are based on the high level of transparency, and participation, and dialogues. So these uh, two days uh, proceedings is uh, one of the high highly uh, important uh, part of the entire uh, mechanism and I'm very uh, pleased to see that you could have joined uh, this important event uh, here today and tomorrow. Judge Noguchi, thank you very much on behalf of the Commission for being here and for these very invaluable insights. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you. Now, of course, uh, much of this illegal trade and trafficking in wildlife must be tackled at the source. What is the level of concern and responsibility of African uh, governments to take measures to curb these activities and bring perpetrators to justice? To discuss uh, this aspect of the issue uh, from the perspective of a, of a source country, or perhaps even more accurately, a source region, it gives me pleasure to introduce now here onto the stage, Judge Fatumatu Diara, who's a lawyer and judge from Mali. And as she makes her way up to the stage, let me say a few words about uh, 
Judge Diara. She's president of the Council of the Université des Sciences Juridiques et Politiques de Bamako in Mali. She was one of the first judges elected to the International Criminal Court and was the first vice president of the ICC. She has also served as a judge for the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Judge Diara, thanks very much for being here. You're also, as uh, mentioned earlier, by uh, the executive director of WJC, one of two accountability panel members who reviewed the map of facts and its update before they were sent to the relevant authorities in Vietnam and later on in China. Uh, Kamudone Niasula is uh, the, the other person who, who looked at this. He's a special prosecutor from Malawi. Without getting into too much of the evidence, obviously, uh, could you explain for us the review process and what your role entailed? I acted as a reviewer of the map of facts and its updates. The Wildlife Justice Commission gave to me and Kamudoni Yasulu once it was completed. Our role was to raise questions and provide a credible review of the information before it is given to the relevant government. This is an important part of the Wildlife Justice Commission process and ensure that the government is confronted with credible evidence. We carefully review all the information and ask questions. If we have found that more information were needed, were necessary, or that there was no sufficient evidence against a particular suspect, the Wildlife Justice Commission would have been bound to seek more information or remove that aspect of suspect from the map of fact or updated. You seem to have been satisfied with what you have read to date when it comes to the evidence, but what about the investigation itself? How would you describe that side of things? Uh, we were satisfied personally me, with the evidence we had. We concluded that the evidence was credible enough to move forward and to present it to the government for them to take action on this basis. Okay, uh, Judge Diara, we focus a lot, uh, of course, on the responsibility of Asian countries such as Vietnam to stop the illegal trade and trafficking in wildlife. Uh, essentially, we focus on the demand side of the equation. Just how important is it to address the supply side in source countries in Africa? Uh, in Africa, it will be necessary to educate the people. Uh, after to our leaders, because Africa has a lot of priorities uh, about people. People don't don't have medical care. We, they need to send their children to school to provide the population with food. So uh, make them invest a lot of energy in uh, fighting against wildlife, wildlife crime yeah. will be difficult. Well, I think it's, it's understood that, of course, there are competing and more pressing urgent yeah. issues Absolutely. that any government, certainly the... Yeah. The, the less wealthy governments of Africa will have to contend with. Yeah. But, but on the other hand, we don't see significant arrests or prosecutions of wildlife traffickers in African countries. I have to say that Kenya, perhaps, to a certain extent, Tanzania as well, but Kenya leads the way in prosecuting uh, wildlife criminal networks. Uh, just recently, uh, we're talking uh, earlier about the importance of going after the kingpins themselves, and that is something that the Kenyan government has done recently. T Tanzania has also taken very important steps as well. But why don't we see more, more uh, prosecutions, in a sense, simply more arrests, if this is an important issue, or government simply not taking it seriously enough? They have uh, relevant texts 
against wildlife, wildlife crime. But the implementation is not easy because a lot of problem. And Isaac will be qualified to provide you with more explanation, more than me. But, but <laughs> wh why do we see this reluctance, though, these endemic delays? Uh, uh, is it also to do with corruption? <laughs> I, I don't mean to put you on the spot in any way, but... Uh, uh, actually, I did not work on the uh, behavior yeah. of population and politician, but I only work on the map of facts. <laughs> okay, uh, I perhaps also want to ask you uh, a, good, a good time to maybe shift slightly. No, but it, just looking at the specific case of, of your own country, yes. many people wouldn't necessarily associate Mali with any kind of poaching, but I know there is poaching going on in the northern parts of Mali that has to do with a very rare breed of, of elephants. And much of it, in fact, as uh, Judge uh, Motunoguchi was alluding to earlier, goes to financing a lot of the conflicts okay. in the region. Could you expand a little bit on this and why this could make it perhaps uh, much more of an issue of concern for governments in the region to, to stop this because of the illicit money that then goes into funding these wars and conflicts? Um, or perhaps the opposite, in fact. That is... Uh very important, but uh, the one who are, who, who are aware uh, will the, will wildlife crime uh, is founding war and jihadists are not the same who take a, a decision against this crime. Mm -hmm. So it is not easy in my country to fight against wildlife crime. It's not uh, easy, but how, how important? Just the final words, perhaps, on, uh, on how crucial you think it is to address this issue in this public setting and from this point on as well uh, in a more serious way in order to implement legislation at the national, international levels. And, and just how confident are you that this kind of public hearing can have a positive impact to sensitize authorities and the public, both in Africa and in Asia? Uh, I inform you here, we will have uh, in January a big international conference of French-speaking country, countries. This will be a relevant occasion to make a statement from World Life Commission to this public in order to make their know which is very important to uh, fight uh, against wildlife justice crime in order to stop founding of jihadism and war in that region. Thank you very much. We shall be following this uh, with great uh, interest. Judge Diara, thank you very much indeed you. Uh, for being here and for giving us a little perspective you, you. on Africa, even though you do not represent any African government. Thank you very much indeed. So, so where then does uh, all of this leave uh, African youth and their involvement? Um, let's discuss uh, the impact wildlife crime has on local communities. And let's look at what role, if any, the youth is playing to protect their national heritage. Uh, Nadav Driver is a Rhino Youth Ambassador. He embodies his generation's passion for wildlife, having grown up as an obsessive, visitor, I think I'm, I'm right in calling you an obsessive visitor to Kruger National Park in his native South Africa, which is also home to the world's largest uh, rhino, if dwindling population, the world's largest rhino population. Um, Nadaf has been actively involved in rhino anti-poaching awareness campaigns for many years, and he is only 21. Uh, <laughs> as a schoolboy a few years ago, when you were just 15 or 16, you set up a wildlife trafficking website offering real... Tracking, not trafficking. <laughs> My apologies. So there we go. Point of order. Correction. Thank you. You set up a wildlife tracking website offering real-time uh, updates 
trafficking is on my mind. Uh, Real-time updates on animal sightings in South Africa's uh, Kruger Park. Uh, you actually ran the site during your breaks. Yeah, I should say, cool. when most of us at your age were simply <laughs> running around during our, our breaks. <laughs> Latest sightings has become one of the top 10 most viewed channels in the country and getting thousands of followers around the globe as well. You'll tell us about this in just a moment. But first off, let me just um, ask you to tell us about the importance for you as a young South African, the importance mm -hmm. and what it means for you to protect your country's rhino population. What made you involved? Uh, what made you get involved in this campaign? So, I remember when, uh, when I was eight years old, uh, I, I moved to South Africa and I really wanted to learn more about South Africa and Africa and its heritage. And so, the best way to do that was to go to the game reserve. My parents thought that, you know, Africa is the most important part of its heritage is its wildlife. And so, at eight years old, I went to the Kruger National Park, one of the most iconic sites for wildlife in the world. And uh, when I went there, it was on this trip that I already learned what, you know, what wildlife is to Africa and how important its animals are, and especially the rhinos. And it's so important to, you know, to keep them safe and around, to, you know, to show the world you know, the amazing creatures that we have and that we need to protect. But how important is this issue for fellow South Africans, for the other young people uh, in your countries and in countries where there is still wildlife? So it's, it's extremely important, you know, tourism, especially in countries in Africa and South Africa, is mainly driven by, you know, people wanting to go on safari. And so a lot of, you know, a lot of the reasons why people go to Africa is to visit these, these wildlife areas. And one of the biggest reasons why it's so important is once, you know, if, if these animals aren't around, uh, you know, Africa and its tourism can really go down a lot. And, uh, and that doesn't only affect you know, obviously it's a tragic and an irreversible loss that we have when, when animals go extinct, but it's also people who are working around these game reserves and have jobs will also lose that. And so it's already, it's a huge issue that, that affects everyone, animals and humans. And just last year, you were one of the few, uh, I think you were six in all, youth rhino ambassadors who went to Vietnam uh, on a mission to help promote the prevention of rhino poaching and what was known as uh, Operation Game Change. Vietnam, as, as we all know, is uh, often referred to as the epicenter of the rhino horn trade. What struck you the most during your visit there, uh, during this campaign and your meetings with fellow Asians? So I think what's, uh, what's really exciting is that uh, there are a lot of projects that are dedicated to, to protecting uh, wildlife and rhinos and anti-animal trafficking. And, and so last year, with Operation Game Change and Project Rhino KZN, um, I went to Vietnam to to kind of educate the community there about the crisis of poaching and animal trafficking and what's happening there. Um, you know, and I think the biggest thing that struck me the most was that people didn't really know what rhinos were as, as animals or elephants, you know, as animals. They, they knew them as a, as a horn or a, or a tusk. And so, you know, that, that was the biggest thing for me was to, to try and teach them that rhinos are actually beautiful animals that, that live, in, you know, live in a game reserve and have, you know, have families or herds you know, and, and stuff like that. And that was kind of you know, back in South Africa with later sightings and, and that community. We strive to teach people around the world uh, about animals as animals and not as just a, a, you know, an issue in the world that, that you know, people don't really know why it's, right. why it's such an important issue. I mean, you talk about the importance of teaching, educating, but, but much of the, the hope that many people have in campaigns like this is pinned on the new generation, that they have a different sense and perception uh, of the issue. Did you find that you had to also teach and educate um, you know, young it, Vietnamese people? And was there really uh, a game change, uh, a meeting of the minds when you went there? So the youth in Vietnam is, is the, the audience that we really went uh, to, to, to go and try to educate. Um, you know, we spoke at schools, at universities, um, at colleges, and, and it was really, you know, it was amazing to see how a lot of them did know about what was happening, and, and they did know a lot about the, the history of this poaching, but just equally, a lot of them didn't know. You know, they didn't know, um, you know, they knew that animal, you know, that horns, you know, come from rhinos, but they didn't know that animals had to be killed to get those horns. Uh, they didn't know, you know, sometimes that, that rhinos are actually living beings, you know, they just know that we must stop buying horns, but a lot of them just didn't know what was the issue. And so, yeah, the, the youth there is, is really 
it was the main uh, the main audience of who we were trying to educate and uh, and I think we did we did manage a lot um, you know of, of teaching them and and just creating awareness. Uh, what for you will represent success in the fight against wildlife? Uh, to, to what, what does it depend on most and foremost? Is it uh, is much of it have going to have to depend on mobilizing uh, people, NGOs, civil society in awareness campaigns, uh, enacting new laws and legislations, uh, international uh, public hearings like this. What do you think should the focus uh, be so on? So I think, I think there, are two, uh, there are two aspects that I think are really uh, just as important. Uh, one is, again, teaching the world about wildlife and, uh, and showing them and educating them about wildlife in their natural habitat and you know, not making it a, a, a scary thing, you know, not showing videos of you know, rhinos being hacked to death, but showing happy videos of, of elephants running around and with their deciding is that what we do that's that's yeah. one of the biggest things that we do we share you know just happy stories we share amazing sightings and that's one aspect I think the other one is especially what what this public hearing is doing is you know we, we've seen the reports and we know that there's a crisis but what we're doing here is just bringing it together and actually trying to you know to 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 make action and and to execute on on those reports and actually you know try and get people arrested for what they're doing and and actually taking action and, and as you say there's a whole set of, of challenges to deal with uh, we talked about uh, the political will not always being there financial resources lacking in some cases skilled human resources as well and let me just mention that you dealt with poaching, poaching in south africa's kruger national park 20,000 square kilometers, a huge area, which is roughly half the size of the Netherlands or Switzerland. And South Africa is one of the relatively more wealthy countries uh, within Africa. So based on your experience, what do you think South Africa can do in order to lead the way on this issue? So in terms of how we, uh, how we uh, hope with poaching uh, and stopping it is, uh, you know, through these live reports, Rangers can go out immediately and, and protect these, uh, you know, protect animals that have been reported to be injured or, you know, ha undergone some uh, poaching activity. And so I think um, South Africa has a lot of signal and a lot of, uh, you know, internet communication. I think that's one of the biggest reasons why uh, my community of later signings has been able to grow. Um, and I think one of the biggest, uh, really easy, actionable ways that, that other countries can really take. Uh, take a stance is to maybe just help a bit with the internet connection so that people you know, can actually report what they're seeing in terms of poaching and stuff like that because you know, people are seeing it but maybe they can't actually report it. And so I think uh, in South Africa that's probably the biggest way that, uh, that we, that we are able to help is the communication and, and getting, you know, getting in contact with the right people uh, instantly. And of course, much of the international community's hopes will be pinned on, on people <laughs> like you. Nadav Asin Driver, thank you very much uh, you so for being much. here with us today. Thank, thank you. you. So we heard some of the key arguments and urgent issues surrounding crimes against rhinos and other endangered uh, animals and the impact all of this has on the communities living nearby, why it is so important to take measures to put an end to these ongoing violations and uh, the illegal trade in wildlife, and so important and crucial to hold those responsible accountable. Now, this brings us to the official part of this public hearing, and it is now my distinct privilege to introduce the parties to this case. Marcus Asner will represent the Wildlife Justice Commission's Chief of Investigations at today's public hearing. Mr. Asner was an assistant United States attorney in New York from 2000 to 2009. He was chief of the Major Crimes and Computer Hacking Unit for two years and served in the Public Corruption Unit. He's managed over 200 investigations and prosecutions, and he currently serves on President Obama's Advisory Council on Wildlife Trafficking, where he chairs the Subcommittee on Enforcement. So a great pleasure to have Mr. Asner here, who will be starting the proceedings very shortly. I would like to say, though, that the Vietnamese government, as I mentioned earlier, decided not to formally participate in the hearing, but to send an observer uh, to the public hearing. We'll do our best, as Mr. Asner, I know, will, to fully represent all the evidence the investigation has found and tell us in detail about the measures the authorities have taken in connection with this case. As Mr. Asner conducts his presentation, members of the accountability panel would, of course, have the chance to ask any questions at any point to clarify any of the evidence 
that Mr. Asner will present. We will also have the opportunity to do so, I believe, uh, following the testimony of uh, the witnesses. And importantly as well, if we haven't gotten to some of the questions, we will certainly leave about five or ten minutes before each break to get to your questions and concerns. So with this, I now hand the floor to Mr. Asner. Thank you. So, Madam Director, esteemed panel, ladies and gentlemen, I want to take you back to five weeks ago, on the 8th of October, 2016. On that day, an undercover investigator working with the Wildlife Justice Commission went to the village of Nikkei, just south of Hanoi in Vietnam. He was posing as a businessman from China who was looking to buy large quantities of ivory, ivory that he would buy and then take to China to sell it. He first went to his store in Nikkei, and after explaining that he was looking for bulk quantities of ivory, he was taken to a mobile phone store about a kilometer away. And ladies and gentlemen, this is what he saw. This is an undercover video. Underneath this tarp was over 400 kilograms of ivory. And this was five weeks ago. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this was not the first time that investigators working for the Wildlife Justice Commission had seen illegal wildlife being sold in Nikkei and a number of villages around that area. In fact, investigators working on this investigation had been there on five previous occasions. In July of 2015, September of 2015, August, uh, uh, October of 2015, and then March and June of this year. And here are some of the things they saw during their visits. They saw massive quantities of rhino horn. They saw tiger skins for sale. And of course, they saw huge quantities of elephant ivory, both worked ivory and raw tusks, all for sale, just like we see right here. Now, the Wildlife Justice Commission team conducted or made a conservative estimate of the quantity and value of the illegal wildlife that they, in the investigation, had observed. And here's what they saw. They saw over 100 kilograms of rhino horn, and that's worth about 42 million on the black market. There were over $3 million worth of tiger parts, skins, teeth, bones, and over 4,600 kilograms of elephant ivory. That's about 6.8 million US dollars. In fact, they observed what was a sprawling, organized, and sometimes surprisingly open market focused on trading in illegal wildlife. Wildlife that included massive quantities of rhino horn, elephant ivory, tiger skins and bones, turtles, pangolin scales, and a whole lot more. They saw ivory and rhino parts openly advertised on the streets in Nikkei. They found approximately 50 different businesses where traffickers were busy selling and processing illegal wildlife parts, often quite openly, for everybody to see. And they encountered 51 different people engaged in the wildlife trafficking business. And what we put up here is a circle, a, a chart that we're not going to go over it in detail, but it gives you a sense that these are the various different individuals who ultimately the, the investigation established were involved in this trade and the lines represent connections between them. And of course, all told, they estimate that they saw during the course of the investigation over 53 million in illegal wildlife parts. Now, let's cut for a moment to a gory detail. How many animals were killed, were slaughtered, to supply the illegal products seen during the investigation. Well, the Wildlife Justice Commission did an estimate of that, and here's what they came up with. Over 400 rhinos killed, they estimate, and in fact, maybe as much as 579 rhinos killed. Over 
570 elephants killed, as many as 900 elephants killed, and 158 to maybe 225 tigers killed. Now, one of the things we're doing over the, today is if you look over on the screen on the far right from the audience point of view, you'll see a tally of the number of animals killed. And you can look up there as we go through the map of facts and the facts that we present today, and you can take a look over there as we start calculating the numbers as we walk through the evidence. So I want to take a few minutes right now to talk about what we hope to do today. As our director just informed you, my name is Marcus Asner, and I'm a lawyer in New York City. In my past life, I was a prosecutor at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Manhattan, and I serve on President Obama's Wildlife Trafficking Advisory Council. At least I do this week. Um, I also serve on the Advisory Council of the Wildlife Justice Commission, and I'm here today presenting a summary of the Wildlife Justice Commission's investigation into trafficking in Vietnam on behalf of the Chief of Investigations. Um, the results of this investigation are laid out in considerable detail in these very voluminous and detailed maps of facts, these reports that the Wildlife Justice Commission refers to as the maps of facts. We'll see them later, but you can see this is one of them, and this is the other, and you'll see there's multi-volumes there, and I promise you I will not read those to you today. We're just going to do a summary of them. So we're not going to go over every detail, but what I do plan to do is introduce portions of the evidence today, all with a view towards giving the accountability panel an understanding of the nature and type of the evidence gathered during the investigation. So what will the evidence show? You're going to see that the evidence will focus on an area of northern Vietnam and a bit over into the border region of China. And to help orient everybody, what we've done is prepared a, a quick video showing some of these maps. So if we could play this and stop at various points. So you'll see this is Vietnam with Ho Chi Minh City on the, on the bottom, on the south, and then Hanoi and Nikkei up at the top. And this is the area we're mainly focused in at the top here. Much of the activity took place in Nikkei, which is a small village south of Vietnam. And you'll see here in the, in the circles, there are, I think, a number of premises, 20-something premises, where they observed wildlife trafficking going on. This is from the streets of Nikkei. Here is some of the ivory that they saw during the course of the investigation. This is another village where the investigators went and they were taken there by some of the people who were steering them. And there they saw these, um, the, these tiger skins and this was offered for sale. I think there were four tiger skins in this picture. They also went to this town called Puki. And there, again, they were taken to premises. And what did they see there? Again, they see worked ivory. These are ivory bengals, all offered for sale quite openly in this town. They also went to another town called Bai Yun. And everybody has to forgive my pronunciation. I am from Texas. <laughs> and again, they see raw ivory, and this was offered for sale there. They also went further north up to China, because some of the trafficking, or a lot of the trafficking, was destined to be transported into China. And what do they see here for sale are worked ivory pieces, both here and other ones. And then across the border, in a little town called Mong Kai, Kai? There's a, a more ivory, and then they also see smuggling across the river. And here's an example where one of the uh, individuals who takes these boats back and forth across the river is smuggling, actually in this instance, from China over to Vietnam. And this is the Khe Long River, which is between China and Vietnam. And this is where a lot of the goods go across. And they also visited an area called the Friendship Pass, which is also in this vicinity, 
at the border region between China and Vietnam. Now, and what about the trafficking? What did the investigators see during the course of their undercover visits? As mentioned, they encountered a large-scale, highly organized, and sometimes shockingly open market for illegal wildlife. A key to the wildlife trade were interpreters, translators, multiple women who served as sort of Chinese language interpreters and tour guides. The interpreters who are introduced, who introduced our uncover investigators to the wildlife trade in Nikkei and surrounding areas. These were the people who were the guide, the entree into the trade. The interpreters ultimately led the investigators to over 50 locations and introduced them to 51 different people who were involved in the trade. Now, much of what the investigators saw was actual physical wildlife products, parts of animals. And if you had the right interpreter to guide you, the village of Nikkei and the surrounding areas just opened up to you and essentially became a supermarket for illegal wildlife products. Illegal wildlife products were shown in display cases, if we can put that up, in store windows even. And in fact, in some of the stores in Nikkei even openly advertised that they were selling goods. Here, for example, is an awning. We've translated it into English, and you see it says ivory, tiger, rosewood, rhino horn. Now, many of the items they saw were worked pieces, such as these pieces of ivory. Also, these pieces of rhino horn. But buyers could also buy raw goods as well, including these ivory tusks stored under a bed in Nikkei. But in addition to these physical stores where the buyers could go and buy wildlife, you could walk in and buy wildlife products, the group of Traffickers, like any good wholesaler or reseller today, offered their goods online. The investigation showed that traffickers advertised their products on, place, on sites like WeChat and Facebook. So here we have rhino horn offered on WeChat. Next, we have tiger skins, again offered online. Next, we have pangolin scales offered online, and you'll see on the bottom we've translated a little bit about that this is um, 300 kilograms for 1,000 RMB per kilo. You'll see at the bottom, put the translation in somewhere. Okay, next. Again, elephant ivory, all offered online, 500 kilograms right here. So where did all this af uh, ivory and rhino horn and other parts go? Who were the traffickers selling to? Of course, we don't know the full extent of where all the trafficked products went, but the evidence suggests that the people in Nikkei were focusing their sales on the Chinese market and that a large portion of the illegal goods were destined for China. In fact, one of the services that many of the traffickers offered was that they would deliver the goods. Just like if you bought a washing machine, you would want it delivered to your home, they would deliver the goods to the buyers in China, and that was one of the services that they offered. What about money? How did they go about getting paid? Now, having prosecuted many narcotics cases, I would have thought that the way of getting paid that they would choose would be through cash, because cash gives you anonymity. But not here. That's not what these people did. So what we see is, in fact, they would show their bank account information. They would give their bank account information to the buyers. And they weren't afraid. They were just openly allowing you to transfer money to them, and then they would deliver the goods to you. Now, one of the things we're going to see is that the nature of the trafficking in the areas around Nikkei changed over time. When the Wildlife Justice Commission conducted its first undercover visit to Nikkei in July of 2015, the market for wildlife products was wide open with wildlife, as I showed you, often displayed in storefronts and in fact advertised in, signs on front, in the signs in front of the buildings. In January of 2016, though, the Wildlife Justice Commission provided 
um, version of the map of facts to the Vietnamese author authorities, and there was a reaction. Things changed. At least there was some reaction. So when the investigators went back in March of this year, things had changed. Instead of a wide open market in Nikkei, what they saw was that the market had moved indoors, that it was now out of sight. Instead of being openly displayed, the investigators had to ask for the wildlife. But unfortunately, the upshot ultimately was the same. Things went underground, but the change was largely cosmetic. And unfortunately, the trafficking continued all the way through five weeks ago on October 8th when this photograph was taken. All right, so that's what I think the evidence will show, but how will it be presented to you today? Um, after a lot of discussions, we decided to adopt a sort of trial-like format where we'll present the evidence through testimony of four different people. Much of the evidence will be presented through Pauline Verhe, who is a senior legal investigator with the Wildlife Justice Commission. She'll walk through the various stages of the undercover investigation, showing some of the videos and the photographs taken during the operation. She'll also walk through some of the research and summary analysis that she and others with the Wildlife Justice Commission um, prepared. We'll also hear from Dr. Barbara Kravendil, who holds a position at the Naturalis um, Biodiversity Center and teaches at the University of Leiden. She'll help us identify some of the species that the undercover operators found during the operation and help explain, for example, why the items from Nikkei are believed to be actual ivory or tiger parts. You'll also hear from Tom Milliken from Traffic, who's an expert in the global wildlife trade. He'll explain how the global trade works generally, and he'll also explain how Vietnam fits in within that global trade. And we'll hear from Peter Moore, who will talk about the Wildlife Justice uh, Commission's in engagement with the VMEs authorities over the last 18 months or so. But ladies and gentlemen, the most devastating evidence that you're going to see today comes from the words and actions of the traffickers themselves. We know what they say because the evidence is depicted in the videos and photographs and audios taken by the undercover investigators in the course of investigation. And we're going to play a number of those recordings for you throughout the day today. And I think that those recordings will provide the most direct, compelling evidence of how these traffickers went about engaging in their massive and illegal trade. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that we'll be using a trial-like format, but as the director pointed out, this is not a trial, and it's important to make that point repeatedly. We're not trying to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. We will not be asking a judge or a jury to find anybody guilty of anything. But instead, we're going to ask the accountability panel to listen to the evidence and to consider, in your opinion, what the next steps should be. And of course, we'll be talking about this further tomorrow and later today before the panel adjourns to deliberate. Now, one of the things we're going to hear about, as I mentioned a moment ago, is that Vietnam has engaged with the Wildlife Justice Commission in connection with the situation in Nikkei. And as mentioned, the Wildlife Justice Commission provided a map uh, in January and then a second updated version of the, man the map effect in July and August of this year. And they've also had numerous meetings with the authorities in Vietnam. Initially, the response was somewhat anemic, but there are reports of minor raids, um, uh, and the main players, unfortunately, had stayed in operation. I think we saw that most vividly in the video that I started out with, where in October, just five weeks ago, the undercovers went to Nikkei and saw all that ivory. But there are some hopeful signs. Um, two days ago, WJC, the World Wildlife Justice Commission, received reports that on Saturday, law enforcement had raided one of the shops that we showed that we'll be talking about today, and that they had seized approximately 200 kilograms of ivory. That's just two days ago. And if that's true, that's a great step. And my hope is that the public hearing will help 
the good, hardworking law enforcement agents in Vietnam in their fight, that this will bolster them. This will help them in their jobs. And I also hope that the people in this room and elsewhere will find ways to assist Vietnam in that fight going forward. And with that, Madam Director, I'd like to now call Pauline Verhe to come and talk. Good morning, Ms. Verhey. Could you uh, introduce our, yourself and to the audience and tell us a little bit about what you do within the Wildlife Justice Commission? Um, good morning, Mr. Asner. I'm Pauline Verhey, as you said, pronounced very good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm the senior that. legal investigator with the Wildlife Justice Commission's investigations team. Um, I'm the legal expert, so to speak, and one of my responsibilities is to uh, compile the evidence that's obtained during field investigations and write it up in a map of facts such as the one that we've presented to the government of Vietnam. All right, did there come a time that you and others at the Wildlife Justice Commission became involved in an investigation into wildlife trafficking in areas of Vietnam and China? Yes. All right, and generally speaking, what sort of trafficking activities were covered in that investigation? Trafficking of ivory, rhino horn, tiger, and other protected wildlife species. And what locations were involved? Uh, initially just Nikkei, uh, the village you introduced before, but uh, later on it expanded to other locations. Were other people also involved in conducting the investigation in addition to you? Yes. And what sort of roles did these people play? Um, initially the team was quite small. We had a senior, legal invest senior investigator who was managing the initial investigation last year. We had a, a case manager and a junior investigator and myself. But later on the team expanded to... Um, more investigators, the chief of investigations came on board and we had several other undercover investigators helping us to conduct the investigation. And is your testimony today based in part on information and material gathered by other people? Yes. All right, and generally speaking, what were some of the investigative techniques that the Wildlife Justice Commission used when it went about conducting the investigation today? Um, a large part of the evidence was uh, obtained through field investigations. We went there five times. Uh, but we also did a lot of uh, research on the internet and we conducted uh, a lot of uh, research on social media such as WeChat and Facebook. All right, so I'd like to go now before the investigation to April and June of 2015. And I want you to explain to us how it came to be that the Wildlife Justice Commission focused on Nikkei. Um, well, uh, while the Wildlife Justice Commission was in the process of being established, we started looking for our first investigation and we were assessing several potential cases and one of those included the illegal wildlife trade in Nikkei. Okay, and uh, how did you go about um, um, looking into uh, areas to investigate? Did, what sort of open source or, or other investigation did you do? Yes, mostly internet research as well as uh, listening and speaking to our network. Okay, so I'd like to now look at um, an exhibit that is marked as 2.01. It's gonna be a video, and before we show the video, could you explain what this is and then talk us through it a little bit and then we'll play the video. Yes, this is a segment of a video that was placed online by investigative journalist Carla Mann. And what you see here is uh, him himself uh, visiting the village for the first time. Okay, and when was this video taken to your understanding? This was uh, in the second half of 2012. And is this one of the videos that the Wildlife Justice Commission focused on when it was trying to decide whether to investigate Nikkei and other areas around there? Yes, correct. If we can, let's play that video. After leaving the shop, our guide was approached by a motorbike rider who told him about another shop in a nearby village we should go and visit. This next place was a real revelation. There were raw tusks and semi-worked items, as well as a lot of end-consumer ivory products. It is very nice. A group of Chinese tourists were in the process of buying a wide range of items. Those appear to be chopsticks underneath there and bangles. Yes. 
Is that rhino? For the first yeah, time, that appears we were to be a rhino a prayer bracelet. bracelet made from rhino horn. Oh, wow. All right, so that's just a snippet, but this was one of the videos that you gathered when you were deciding to go focus on Nikkei. Yes. All right, I want to focus on a couple of screenshots just from this video. If we could put up 2.02. .02. Um, what's depicted here? Uh, what's depicted is uh, the inside of the shop. Uh, on the left side, you see uh, a group of uh, Chinese buyers, and on the right side, sitting on the floor, is uh, what looks to be the owner of the shop. All right, and you see on the left side, the individual has something on his left hand. What does that appear to be? Those appear to be ivory bangles. And you see things on the floor, those also look like bangles? Yes. All right, if we could go to another screenshot of 2.03. All right, and what does this appear to be? Uh, this appears to be that same uh, owner of this shop, uh, and in her hands she's holding a number of ivory bangles, as well as what look to be uh, US dollar bills. And these look like dollars. Now, this woman, does she appear elsewhere in your investigation? Uh, yes, we're going to actually see a lot of her during the investigation. And I notice there's also a display case behind there that appears to also have objects in it? Yes. All right. Now, as part of the initial open source phase of the investigation, were you also able to locate articles regarding wildlife trafficking in Vietnam? Yes, we found several articles online, uh, in particular by, placed by the same investigative journalist, Mr. Carl Arman. So if we could put up 2.04 for a moment. Um, I'm not going to ask you to read this article to everybody, but if you could just give us a quick, a quick thumbnail of what is indicated in that. Uh, in this article, he discusses uh, the widespread illegal wildlife trade in Vietnam, and he also discusses what he discovered in Nikkei. And uh, what's clear is that there is apparently, he documented that there was at that point in 2012 uh, a lot of illegal trade in raw and worked ivory and rhino horn, and that there was smuggling taking place uh, to China. Okay, so I want to now fast forward a little bit to July of 2015. Specifically, let's focus on July 17th of 2015. Did there come a time that the Wildlife Justice Commission sent undercover investigators to Vietnam to investigate this alleged trafficking? Yes, this was in July last year. Okay, so now how many undercovers went during that first visit? We sent two undercover investigators. All right, now they're undercover, so we're not going to use their names today. Um, without telling me their names, can you describe generally what roles they were purporting to play? Uh, they were posing as uh, people from mainland China, and they were posing to be potentially interested buyers for ivory. All right, so let's now focus specifically on the 17th. Where were the undercover operators that day? They were in a hotel in Hanoi. Okay, now did there come a time when they spoke by telephone with a woman who, um, an interpreter, who we're going to call person of interest number 16? Yes. All right, and to orient the panel and the audience, um, the, the individuals who are in those 51 all have a different number assigned to them and they will be called POI for person of interest one through 51. So this is POI 16 who is a woman, who is an interpreter. All right, how did it happen that the undercover investigators came to talk to the woman known as POI 16? Well, we'd received uh, intelligence that there were uh, a group of a number of uh, interpreters in the area of Hanoi who were able to take Chinese visitors to uh, places like Nikkei to purchase wildlife products. Approximately how many different telephone numbers for interpreters did you have? Around 14. All right, and um, when they called up this woman, interpreter number 16, um, what was the pretext that they used when talking to her? The pretext they used was that they were interested in buying handicraft. Okay, so let's, um, and, and was that conversation recorded? Yes, it was. Okay, so let's pull up 3.01, and if we can, before we play it, if you could just orient us a little bit to uh, this conversation, and then we'll go ahead and play it. <clears throat> okay, this is the, uh, the conversation where one of our investigators is talking to the interpreter, asking about handicraft. All right, and to orient the audience for a moment, we have at the bottom um, the, uh, the English language translation. 
WJC is meant to indicate the uh, undercover who's speaking, and then we'll also have an, in, in, uh, the POI 16, and that indicates the interpreter. So let's go ahead and play this video and uh, audio. Uh, Donkey is another village there? Yes. Uh Okay, so following this uh, telephone conversation, did there come a time that the investigators acting in an undercover capacity actually met this interpreter who we've called POI-16? Yes, they met her the day after. Okay. The interpreter had rented a car and took them to Nikkei. All right, and approximately how far is that drive? It was, around, minutes, it was around 40 minutes from Hanoi to Nikkei. All right, and during the car ride, did they have any discussion with Person of Interest 16, the interpreter, about why she chose to take them to, Ni to uh, Nikkei? Yes, they wanted to know what was so special about Nikkei, and she responded that other villages have potential risks of getting caught by the police, but not so in Nikkei. And did she explain why it was that the police don't come to Nikkei? Yeah, she said that people here have their connections. Okay. All right, so I'd like to now focus on that day. Approximately how many premises did they see during that first day? Approximately 25. All right, so if we could pull up 3.02. This is a satellite photograph of Nikkei. Could you orient us a little bit to what these various red boxes are? Those red boxes indicate the premises that we have visited and where we have identified uh, persons of interest. All right, and I noticed at the bottom here it says Nikkei, and then it says PNK1 through PNK16. What does the code PNK stand for? P stands for premises, and Nikkei stands for Nikkei. Okay, so this is premises Nikkei1 through premises Nikkei16. Correct. Okay. So um, let me first, let me pull up 3.03, .03, which is a video. I think it's a compilation. If, before we play it, could you just briefly orient us to what we'll see here, and then we'll go ahead and play this video. Yeah, first we see uh, uh, a little video of the street in Nikkei, the main street where most of the shops are. And subsequently, we will see a photographs taken of each of the, or most of the shops. And as you'll see, all of these shops have display cases facing the street uh, and containing illegal wildlife products. Okay, so let's go ahead and play the video, and as we do so, if you could, um, as you see fit, uh, narrate. This is our interpreter. And we're now in that street. We're now in the main street in the main in street in Nikkei. So that's the shop front of shop one, shop two. And you see these items that look like ivory carvings and bracelets. All openly necklaces. displayed. Yes. This is 5 and 20? <coughs> yes, that was later identified to be the same shop. And more what looked to be ivory products in shop 7, shop 8. And underneath you see timber products. It's very clear that there's a mixture of timber trade and ivory and other wildlife trade going on in this village. This is interesting because here the people are seen to be processing ivory beads and making them into necklaces. And this, if you just saw that, there was a guy hand, hand, holding a raw tusk. More ivory, timber, ivory. 
And this is the inside of uh, PNK1, one of the key uh, residences that we've discovered during uh, this mission. Uh, as you see, it's quite grandly furnished. PNK2, PNK3, 4, so that's, well, we'll come to discuss that later. And PNK5. Okay, and, and this is all on the first day? Yes. Okay, so um, generally speaking, and we'll go through a number of these encounters during that first day in just a moment. Generally speaking, what were some of the things that they observed that day? Well, the most, the, the, the most clear impression they had was that there was, as uh, Mr. Carl Lamont had indicated, wide, widespread illegal uh, trade in uh, endangered species products. Uh, it was clear that uh, a lot of the shops were actually houses that were used as retail pre uh, residences. Um, the shopkeepers, mo most of them were very familiar with our interpreter, with the interpreter used by the investigators. And she also said, I know all these shops here, I help them sell stuff. And they saw a range of products uh, like ivory, timber, rhino horn powder, carvings and bangles, bear gold bladders, turtle bone, and turtle bone shells, uh, pangolin scales and red coral. And also they saw a lot of people from China, Chinese buyers in the streets. So they saw other customers and they, they observed that they were Chinese? Yes. All right, so I wanna focus on a few of the shops. We're not gonna go through all of the shops because we'll be here throughout the week if we had to do that. Um, let's talk about PNK1, Premises Nikkei 1. What did the undercover investigators observe there? Well, they saw it was, as they said, it was the biggest mansion in the village, which was richly decorated. Uh, it had uh, rosewood furniture inside, uh, display cases containing what looked to be ivory products. Uh, there were scales there, and uh, they were offered quite a range of uh, ivory and rhino horn products. And by scales, you're not talking about pangolin scales, you're talking about sp scales to weigh ivory yes. or rhino horn. Yeah, correct. All right, and did they encounter any individuals? Yes. Who did they encounter? Uh, the shop owner and his wife. And the shop owner, interestingly, was nicknamed Uncle Rhinohorn. His, so his nickname was Uncle Rhinohorn. Yes. All right. And did they also encounter any businessmen uh, while they were there, other customers? Yes. There was a group of uh, businessmen from Guangxi in China uh, who were quite ch chatty. So there was a lot of uh, chat chatting going on with our investigators. They explained that they were in Nikkei for the first time and they were looking to supply their wholesale shop in Zhuhai, Guangdong. All right, and did they observe any purchases during this first visit? No. All right, um, did they um, observe any conversations or engage in any conversations with the people there? Yeah, there was a lot of conversation. So and could you walk through some of the things that they heard while they were there? Yes, well, firstly, it was clear that uh, the female shop owner was uh, very much in charge there. She kept on calling in for products and uh, ringing people on the phone to bring in more products to show to the customers. She'd explained that she'd, they'd been in the Rhinohorn and Ivory business for about a year and that previously they were involved in Rosewood trade. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is uh, walk through some of the photographs that were taken during the visit to PNK1. If we could pull up 3.04. Uh, what's depicted here? This is the inside of PNK1. Okay, and if we could go to 3.05, what is this? That's a Mercedes E-Series that was parked just outside this uh, house. And do you have a sense how much that would cost in Vietnam? In Vietnam, depending on which type of E-series, it would cost either 1 billion Vietnamese dong or 2 billion Vietnamese dong. And approximately, what's that in US dollars? Sorry, I should correct. It was between 2 billion US dong, or Vietnamese dong, or 3 billion Vietnamese dong. Okay. And US dollars, that is uh, 90,000 US dollars or 135 US dollars. All right, and approximately, what's the average income in Vietnam? That's approximately 210 US dollars per month. So let's go to 3.06. What's depicted here? This is the group of uh, Chinese people from Guangxi, and to the left you see the owner of the house holding what look to be ivory bangles. Okay, so just so um, everybody's clear, um, the, the faces are blurred out. Why was that done? That's for privacy reasons, and also because we don't want to jeopardize a potential criminal investigation by the Vietnamese authorities. Okay, and uh, what appears to be held in this person's hand? That appears to be an ivory bangle. All right, if we could go to 3.07. 
What, what does this appear to be? Uh, these are several uh, raw ivory parts that were offered for sale to our investigators, placed on a scale. Okay. And if we could, and this was all in PNK1 on the very first day that they went there. Yes. All right, if we could pull up 3.08, which is a video, and before we play the video, if you could just orient us a little bit to what we expect to see. Yes, here we're going to see, this is still in that same mansion, PNK1. Uh, we see the Chinese buyers sitting around the table here, and what you'll see is that uh, a rhino horn is brought in. All right, and again, to orient everybody, WJC, that's the undercover, and then what we'll see is the other indications of POI, X, Y, and Z. These are the various individuals who we have identified by number as persons of interest, 1 through 51. Let's go ahead and play this. That's the rhino horn? Yes. Just brought in by the lady of the house. They're now going to weigh it. Two point five kilograms? Yes. Approximately how much is that in dollars? She's going to tell us. <laughs> so you need about two or three of those to buy the Mercedes? Correct. All right, let's pull up 3.09. What is this? This is a profile, a WeChat profile page um, of that same female owner of that house that we saw before. Now, how is it that the investigators got this WeChat profile page? Well, typically during this investigation, we discovered that most of these people have WeChat, and if our investigators would visit uh, a trader, they would exchange WeChat details and connect to each other on WeChat in order to facilitate discussions about illegal wildlife. All right, and for the Luddites like me and the audience, um, actually, can you tell us what WeChat is? Oh, WeChat is a Chinese messaging app, much similar to WhatsApp in the rest of the world. Okay, and then let's focus on some of the goods here. I see four photographs with right next to the word album. Can you walk us through what you saw with respect to, in those photographs? Uh, the first two on the left are videos, uh, but the third one is of interest because those are what look to be ivory products. It looks like carved ivory products? Yes. All right, let's go to 3.10. This is a profile page of her husband. Uh, and again, we blurred out details here in order for, for privacy purposes. And how did we receive this? in that same house uh, on the same day. We and could you walk us through some of the photographs of things you see? Here again, on the left, you see uh, a photo of what look to be ivory rings or bangles. All right, and if we could now look at 3.11. All right, and what is depicted here? It looks like a, a photograph of a cell phone. Yes. And things are blurred out. How did we get this, and can you w explain what it is, and especially what's been blurred out? Uh, we got this after our investigators uh, were uh, in a dialogue with uh, the, owner, the, the two owners of the house about potentially buying those ivory products we saw on a scale before. And they explained that if our investigators would be interested to buy those items, they would have to uh, make a payment into their bank account in China. Okay. So they, they're not asking for cash? No. They're going to directly deposit into their bank account, and then after they're deposited, then the goods are delivered? Yes. Okay. All right, so let's go to the next premises. Again, we're not going to go through all the premises, but we're going to spend more time on this first trip and then probably go a little bit quicker through the subsequent field missions just so people have a sense of both the techniques and the things that we see. A lot of it will end up being somewhat repetitious, and so we'll move faster as we go. All right, so if we can go to PNK2, I believe we have a map here, and PNK2 is down here. All right, um, could you describe the premises that they encountered when they went to PNK2? Yes, again, it was a house, and inside the house was uh, more rosewood furniture, um, and they found two, uh, a group of individuals there, two unidentified females, an unidentified man, and uh, another man who later introduced himself as the, the, uh, the manager of the shop. Okay, so let's go to 3.13. All right, so what is depicted here? This is the inside of PNK2. 
All right, I noticed yeah. that there is a staircase over here. Yes. And then uh, a table over here. Mm -hmm. And then the, it looks like there are a couple of large bags underneath the staircase. Yes. And I see a green uh, bin or base uh, basket. Okay, so can you describe, um, actually let's go to 3.14. All right, what appears in this photograph? Here again, you see that green basket, and inside you see uh, white pieces uh, covered in black paint. And the, uh, the owner of the shop explained to us that those were uh, uh, ivory, pro ivory products of ivory with uh, paint, covered in paint. And I notice also there's a red bin that we couldn't see when we walked in, but it appears also to contain pieces of ivory that have been painted black. Yes. Now, what was the explanation for the fact that the ivory had black paint on it? Um, he explained that uh, ivory was painted black to facilitate smuggling from Africa. Now, from your work in this area, are you familiar with some of the ways that traffickers disguise ivory when smuggling it across borders? Yes, there are several means of disguising uh, ivory when it's smuggled across, and uh, those include painting them black, but there's also for example, there's been a case where uh, ivory was disguised as chocolate pieces, so traffickers are quite uh, creative. So let's pull up 3.15. We're leaving Nikkei just for a moment, but we'll be back. What's depicted in this photograph? Uh, these are pieces of ivory tusks that were seized in February 2015 in Hong Kong. Uh, it came from Nigeria, and it was detected by sniffer dogs. Sniffer dogs. And again, we see that this is painted black. Yes. Um, did the proprietors of PNK2 know where within Africa the ivory had come from? Well, they did not indicate that they knew, but they said as long as the quality is good. Um, and um, did they talk any about their business, where they supply ivory to? Um, yes, they did. Uh, they said they were able to supply it to China, including to Shanghai and Beijing. Uh, there was also discussion about uh, different, di different prices of rhino horn and ivory. And he also explained that he has a shop in Dongxing in China, just across the border from Kai, which is managed by his younger female cousin. Okay, so, and I, I believe that's somebody that we'll encounter later in the presentation today. Yes. All right, if we could pull up 3.16, what is that? Uh, this is once again a, a WeChat profile page for this individual, person of interest number three. Okay, and what appears to be depicted in the photographs there? Those appear to be timber beads or bracelets. Were there any discussions with these proprietors that they encountered at PNK2 about how they would accept payment for the various goods that they were offering? Yes, they, uh, like the people in PNK1, uh, indicated they have bank accounts at the Bank of China and uh, they would accept payment within those bank accounts and would then organize the smuggling into China. Now, was there any discussion about what would happen if they got caught doing yes. all of this trade? Yes. Uh, person of interest number three indicated that they would take full uh, responsibility. So if there was a, a seizure or some sort of intervention, uh, they would make sure that the customer was compensated. And you mentioned earlier that they, that they said that they were connected with a place in China. Was that in Dongxiang? Dongxiang. And did they provide any information so that we could encounter or deal with the person up in Dongxiang? Yes, they gave the phone number for their younger female cousin. Okay. So I'd like to go to PNK3 now. If we could pull up our map. PNK3 is down here. So tell us who they encountered when they went to PNK3. There was a group of males and females there, and one of them identified themselves. He's now our person of interest number four. Um, there wasn't actually a lot of discussion about buying anything, but during, our visit, during the visit of our investigators in that shop, uh, someone came from outside into the shop and brought out a piece of rhino horn. So he just walked into the shop with a piece of rhino horn, yes. presumably to sell it to them? Yeah, our interpreter later, on, later explained that that guy had come in to um, sell that rhino horn to the shop owner. Was there any discussion about uh, their business? What sort of products were available or also they, how they went about shipping things and where they shipped it to? 
Yeah, they explained that, that they had all kinds of products available and they were able to ship to Shanghai, Hong Kong as well, but only for large quantities. Um, they said they had rhino horn in stock, but there was no discussion about prices. And what about processing? Taking ivory and working it. Was there any activity in that regard in this process? Yes, there was equipment in the shop which looked to be used for processing ivory beads. All right, so now I want to go to uh, another location, PNK4, and we're going to see a lot about PNK4 today. Um, if you could, let's pull up 3.21. What's this? This is the outside of the shop that we identified as PNK4. Um, Blurred is the name of the shop, and as you see, the shutters are closed, so the shop appears to be closed. All right, so let's go to 3.22. This is just next to that uh, shop front, and this is the entrance to the courtyard of the house that's behind the shop. So in other words, you didn't go in the front. With this particular one, you had to go through the courtyard. Yes. All right, so now I want to pull up 3.24. What's depicted here? Uh, we're inside the shop right now. You see the shutters from the, from the outside. Uh, and depicted here is the, the owner of the shop uh, behind her counter. Okay, so let me just orient this a little bit. Up top here, it looks like we have pieces of ivory. Yes. All right, and then over here, that looks like a scale on the left. Correct. All right, and then below, it's a little hard to see in this photograph, but it appears that there's another scale here. Yes. In, in, in the, the scale in the counter, is that one that would be used for uh, different types of goods than the one on the counter? Yes, the one below the counter is used for uh, uh, measuring the weight of uh, very precious commodities like rhino horn bracelets because they are so expensive. Right, and the and one on top? And those are more top? exact, so they measure the weight more exact than the one on top. Okay, and the one on top could be used for what sort of goods? for ivory tusks, for example. All right, and we can see in the counter, it appears, and we'll look at this a little closer, other items are in the counter. Yes. All right, I wanna focus for a moment on this woman. Um, let's pull up 3.25. All right, on the left, we have the photograph that we just looked at. What is the photograph on the right? That's the same screen grab from Mr. Carl Amann's video that we saw earlier. And does this appear to be the same woman? Yes. So she was trafficking in 2012, and then we encountered her in July of 2015. Yes. All right, and this woman, did she speak just Vietnamese, or did she also speak Chinese? Um, she spoke mostly Vietnamese, but she was able to speak uh, Chinese where it came to the, the products she was uh, advertising, as well as prices. Okay, so I'd like to now focus on some of the things that they observed, some of the products that they observed in PNK4. Let's go to 3.26. All right, so if you could walk us through what we're seeing here. Yes, again, we see the display, uh, the counter with the display case uh, underneath. Uh, you see a range of products that look to be made of ivory, including figurines and bangles, bracelets and necklaces. Uh, on the top of the counter, you see three ivory figurines made from ivory tusk tips. And these are the tips of the tusk? Yes. And those are carved in? Okay. Yes. And then what's over to the right? Those appear to be two tips of rhino horn. Okay. All right. And what conversation, if any, did the undercovers have with this woman, who I think we identified as person of interest number five? Right, that's correct. Um, well, interestingly, she said that they'd, they'd had hundreds of kilos of processed ivory, but had just sold out that morning. Uh, there was also discussion about prices and also about delivery of those items that uh, investigators might be interested to purchase into China. And where were some of the locations that she could deliver goods if there was a willing buyer? She said she could deliver to Pingxiang and Fujian. And what about paying for the transportation costs? How was that handled? Uh, well, firstly, the transportation cost would depend on the purchase size, um, but all of it was, would be done through uh, transfer of money into a bank account. Okay, I want to now focus on 3.27, which is a video. If you could, uh, we'll play the video in a moment, but if you could orient us about what we expect to see, and then we'll go ahead and play the video. Uh, this is a video of some of the ivory products that we observed for sale in P PNK4 on that day. All right, if we could go ahead and play that video. Yes. 
This is a side room next to that shop uh, room. It looks like they're pulling things out from underneath the bed. Yeah, this is our interpreter pulling out an ivory tusk from under the bed, and there were six in total. Underneath the bed. Yeah. All right, now let me focus on um, 3.28, which is another video. If you could orient us with respect to that video, uh, and then um, we'll go ahead and play it. Yes, in this video, uh, the person of interest number five is going to explain how, to, how the smuggling is conducted into China. Okay, so that's person of interest number five, who we saw uh, originally in Carl Lamont's video back in 2012, and we had a still photograph of her a moment ago. So POI 05, person of interest five, is talking with the interpreter. Let's proceed. I should just add that she's wearing a blue shirt now because uh, it's the day after. Oh, so, so they went back went on both, on both the 18th days. and the 19th of July? Yes. Okay, go ahead. And where's Ping Shan? Uh, that's a Chinese border town just across from Friendship Pass, which is in... Uh, so she could take things over there? Yes. You don't have to worry about getting it over the border yourself, she'll deliver it. Yeah. And they're talking about the border gates at this point? Yes. All right, let's pull up 3.30. What does this appear to be? This is the WeChat profile page of this person of interest number five. Okay, and what appears in the photographs? Those appear to be rhino horn cups and some bangles. Let's pull up 3.31. What does this appear to be? Well, again, blurred out, but here she provided uh, three Chinese bank accounts with the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, the China Construction Bank, and the Agricultural Bank of China. All right, and then if we could uh, actually just zero in on that, I guess that's 3.32. Uh, these appear to be the, the, the banks that we're talking about, yes, bank account correct. numbers. She yeah. provides this and the plan is that you wire money to her and she delivers the goods, including across the border into China. Yeah, and actually those bank accounts are not in her name, so they're in the name of another other person. And quite clearly there is a, a, a specialized role in that criminal network where individuals organize the whole smuggling aspect of the trafficking. All right, let's take a quick look at our map for a moment. Um, we're now going to go briefly to PNK5, and I know that we go back there, so I'm not going to dwell on that, um, but that was also one of the premises that was visited that day. Yes. All right, I want to now talk, um, in the course of the day, were there a series of uh, conversations that took place with other individuals? Yes. All right, let's pull up 3.33, which I think is a video of discussions with Chinese businessmen. So if you could orient us about what this is and then we'll walk through the video. 3.33? Am I on the wrong one? Uh, no, that could be right. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this video includes a discussion with one Chinese buyer who explains uh, how, why Chinese people now come to Vietnam to purchase uh, wildlife products. Can we play this one? No, 3.33. Ah, okay. These are various shops. Okay, so, yeah, sorry, I was mis uh, confused here. These are several uh, Chinese individuals that we encountered in that village on that day. 
He's talking about what? Transporting from Africa? Yeah, there's discussion generally about transportation from Africa to China, and he's explaining that uh, it's very difficult now to get ivory into China. And so it's more convenient to go through Vietnam at this juncture? Yes. And it mostly comes from Kenya, is what he said. That's actually our investigator that's just making conversation. Okay. Yeah. So, um, one more video here. Um, let's pull up 3.35. Was there a discussion? Uh, well, why don't you walk us through this discussion that happens in this video? Yeah, this, firstly, this is a uh, part of a video uh, where our investigators are on, on, the route, on the road to Nikkei together with the interpreter, and uh, this is where they're discussing what's so special about Nikkei. And the second part of the video shows uh, the same Chinese buyer we saw before, also talking about the element of corruption. Okay, so if we could go ahead and play this video. <laughs> This appears to be PNK4, is that correct? Yes, correct. That's another buyer, a Chinese buyer? Yes. Again, discussing that China is expecting so strictly now. So China is cracking down. Yes, correct. Now, in the course of the day, uh, I presume that they had a number of conversations with the interpreter. P yes. who we've called POI-16. Um, among other things, what was discussed with her while they were work walking their way through Nikkei about how uh, the shops ship into China? She said that the big shops can ship the products to China. And that's what the in investigators learned as well in these five premises that we visited. So the bigger shops could go ahead and yeah. make the shipments into China. All right. So, um, and. Total, how many shops did they visit on the first field visit? In this first field visit, they visited 25 shops. Okay. And we only looked at a few of them for the purposes of this presentation. Yes. I'd like to jump forward then to September, in particular the 24th of September. Did there come a time that the Wildlife Justice Commission sent undercover investigators back to Vietnam to uh, investigate the alleged trafficking? Yes, we sent one investigator. All right, was it the same investigator or different investigator? Uh, it was a different investigator. It was actually uh, a Western investigator posing as an interested buyer for uh, some jewelry for his uh, girlfriend. Okay, so it was a Caucasian this time. Yes. All right, if we could pull up our map, 4.01. There we go. Um, and which premises did they visit this time? Um, they went to premises P and K six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven, and they also visited P and K five, which had been identified in July that year. Okay, so six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven, and then they went back to P and K five, which is here. Now, who selected? these particular locations to go to? Uh, no one selected them. It was just a matter of going there and seeing what was... was the in, did the interpreter select them or did they oh, just walk right. the streets? Yes. Well, the interpreter would bring them there, and, uh, but in this case there was an interpreter actually. There was no interpreter no. for this one. They just went to the yeah. streets and walked in. Yes. And 
being a Westerner, they could walk in and observe some of the things we're about to show. Yes, quite All remarkable, right. actually. So let's take a look at them. We're going to run through a series of photographs. I'm not going to dwell too much, but if you could just orient us as we run through the photographs and tell us what is seen there. Let's go to 4.03. All right, so what is depicted here that this investigator observed? Yes, this is a display case at PNK 7, and inside of this display case are what appear to be ivory bangles and bracelets. So let's go to 4.05. Uh, this is the display case outside PNK 8, and once again, these appear to be ivory uh, carvings, uh, bracelets, and necklaces. Let's go to 4.09. Uh, this is a Chinese buyer who was encountered at PNK 5, and in his hands, he's holding a caliper which he was using to measure ivory beads that were being processed in that shop. So that's a caliper up there? Yes. Uh, let's go to 4.11. What appears here? Uh, this is a display case outside PNK 9, or inside, actually, on the street side. Uh, and inside are uh, numerous items that appear to be made of ivory. When you say on the street side, is this something that would have been visible from the street looking in? Yes. And all of this is just openly displayed on the street? Yes. So let's go to the next one, which I think is 13. Yeah, these are ivory products offered for sale at PNK 10. So bangles in different sizes and necklaces. Let's go to 4.14. What does this appear to be? Uh, this, is the in this is a display case um, at PNK 10. Uh, you see a scale here, and on the scale you see uh, some pieces of offcut of Rhinehorn, as we've come to call them. So. So just so everybody can see, it looks like there's a display case. This is a glass top. Through that, we see what appear to be necklaces and bangles, and those appear to be made out of ivory. Yes. And then on top of it, there's a scale, and you say that it appears to be two pieces of rhino horn on top of that. Yes, and they were advertised as rhino horn. And if we could go to 4.15, what does this appear to be? This is a display case in PNK 6. And right. inside, again, you see several items that appear to be made of ivory, including uh, a tusk tip, carved tusk tip. And if we could go to 4.16, what does this appear to be? Uh, these appear to be bags filled with pangolin scales, uh, as well as uh, one, what, a, a tooth that appears to be from a tiger, um, and ivory products for sale at PNK 6. So the bags appear to be the pangolin scales, it looks like you have ivory carvings up on the upper right corner, and then you say that that appears to be a tiger tooth. Yes. All right, and if we go to 4.20, what does this appear to be? This is a, a WeChat profile page again of uh, a person of interest we encountered during that uh, field mission, person of interest number seven. And what appears, on, uh, the, what appears in this photograph at the top? That's, that appears to be a timber statue with two, what appear to be, ivory tusks coming out of it. All right, and then let's go to 4.21. And this uh, looks like a display case again. Um, you can see in the reflection that it looks like we're out on the street. Yes. Okay, and if you could tell us what's depicted in this display case as far as you can tell. Uh, this display case was observed at PNK 11, um, and inside on the top, uh, shelf, you see uh, several items that appear to be made of ivory, and down below, those appear to be made of several types of timber products. Okay, and it looks like at the very bottom, what does that appear to be? Uh, I think that those look like incense cones. Okay. Um, and each of these photographs were taken during the second field visit in Nikkei? Yes. All right, so now let's go to the third field visit. And we're talking about now October of 2015. Did there come a time that the investigative team went back to Nikkei? Um, actually, this, this time we didn't go to Nikkei. We went to uh, Monkai in Dongxing because we were interested to find out more about this smuggling going on between Vietnam and China. Okay, so let's just take a moment uh, to orient ourselves. We pulled up map, map number, uh, we've marked 5.01. I see at the bottom, we've got Hanoi, and then the red balloon is Nikkei. 
Yes. All right, and then we go up north, you see the Friendship Pass, and then really uh, north, east, east, we see two towns. One is Mong Kai, and then the other is Dong Xin. Yes, correct. And is Mong Kai on the Vietnamese side? Yes. And Dong Xin is on the uh, Chinese side. Okay, so um, if you could walk us through um, what was, why it was that we went, let's focus first on October 2nd, who they encountered and how it was that they ended up with this person. Well, one of the objectives, as I said, for this field mission was to understand more about the smuggling going on, but it was also to visit that shop that was mentioned during the first field mission in July 2015, where person of interest number three explained that he had a shop in Dongjing as well, managed by his younger female cousin, and we really wanted to meet her and understand more about her involvement in the trade. And, and did the investigators actually meet this woman? Yes. By the way, I should, I should make clear, were these the same undercover investigators as with the first field mission or were they different? They were different. And who were they posing as? They were posing as Chinese buyers from China. Now, the woman that they encountered, the younger cousin, the one, um, was she given a number? Yes, her number is person of interest number 28. All right, um, and were there discussions with this woman about her life and, and her business? Yes, she explained to our investigators that she had lived in Mongkai for 16 years, uh, that she ran an agarwood shop in Dongxing across the border together with her niece, and she uh, spent quite a lot of time explaining how she sources products, ivory products from Nikkei. Uh, All right, so we pulled up uh, exhibit 5.02, which is gonna be a video uh, again, before we play the video, could you just walk us through what we expect to see? Yes, in this video you'll see person of interest number 28 explaining her connection with Nikkei uh, and also how she sources her products from Nikkei. Okay, and where are they sitting? They're sitting in a restaurant. All right, and this is in which side? On the, on <coughs> the Vietnamese side or on the Chinese side? I believe this was on the Chinese side. Okay, so if we could go ahead and play this video. She's talking about crossing the border every day. Yes. And she sleeps in Vietnam at night. Yeah, that's where her home is. She comes in the morning and then goes back. Yeah. She's referring to the individual we met earlier. Mm -hmm. And POI 3 is her older cousin. Yes, basically. We're talking about delivering within China. Yes. So they they bring the goods from Nikkei up to Dongxian and then they mail it out from there within China. Correct. All right. Um, did there come a time that the investigators went with her to visit her premises? Um, well, initially, the, on the first day, they visited her uh, shop in Dongxing, and yes, on the second day, they went to her home in Vietnam. All right, so let's pull up 5.05. .05. All right, and this is a video. Can you, it's going to be a little jarring, um, but it's before lunch. Um, I mean, jarring in the sense that it actually shakes. Uh, <laughs> not that it's ugly, although it is that too. Uh, if, if you could walk us through what we expect to see here. Yes, this is still in uh, Dongxing in China, um, and she's explaining here that she can deliver anything customers like into China. She's also going to show a few ivory items that she has in the shop, um, and she's also going to explain how uh, they can cross the river illegally by boat. Okay, so she's going to walk through, show items, and also talk about how she actually gets things across the border. Yes. All right, so let's go ahead and play this video. It's not too bad. 
who is that individual? This is person of interest number 28. This is inside of her shop. And that's the younger cousin? I don't know. So they're taking her upstairs, taking the investigators upstairs? Yes. She's also going to explain at some point that uh, she's very nervous about having anything in China because of the inspections. So this is the only stuff she has upstairs in her and shop. These appear to be ivory products. Yes. But she says there are more in Vietnam. Yeah. She's got everything there. She said beads, necklaces, etc. Mm -hmm. And Mong Kai is in Vietnam. Yes. Talking about taking a boat across the river between Vietnam and China? Yes. And that talks about 200 RMB for a return? Just to be clear, that's not the legal way of crossing the river. Right. right. Yeah. This is not. This is not with a, vi a visa. No, exactly. All right. Did they have a discussion about meeting the next day? Yes. All right. So let's go to the next day. Um, where did they meet? They met in her home in uh, Mong Kai. Okay, in the Vietnamese side. Yes. All right. So um, let's pull up 5.06. And before we play that video, if you could orient us to uh, what's depicted here. Yes, what's depicted here is a discussion our investigators had with her in her home in Mong Kai, uh, where she's showing them some ivory products. And she's also discussing about how government controls have become very strict in China, and it's quite difficult to get products right now. Um, and she's also explaining how she gets goods in from Nikkei. Okay, and so the woman in the yellow shirt, who is that? That's person of interest number 28. Okay, and then uh, who appears to be, uh, you can actually see them, but you see the left hand coming down and touching some of the items. That's one of our investigators. All right, so if we could play this video. <laughs> They're talking about the Chinese government cracking down. Yes. Showing necklaces, it looks like? Yes. And lucky buckles, as they're called. Lucky buckles? Yes. I'm talking about where she imports them from. From she gets them from Saigon, Ho Chi Minh yeah. City. Yeah. Ho Chi Minh City. And then they're brought up to, to the border. No, they're brought up to Nikkei. And brought. so the raw product comes from uh, Saigon, as she explains, and it's processed in Nikkei and then brought over. And there's a boss from Fujian. Yes. So the raw material comes over from Africa to Saigon, yeah. according to her. Mm -hmm. So it's getting more difficult this year, she claims. Yes. All right, so in the course of this, was there any discussion about actually doing the smuggling itself, getting the goods across? 
Yes. All right, and we'll pull up 5.07, which is a video, uh, but if you could, um, before we play this video, set the scene for us. It looks like this is our woman in the yellow shirt. Um, and describe the conversation, set the scene, and what we expect to see in this video. Okay, so here again is person of interest number 28, explaining that she has a, a, per a person who can help her get goods across uh, from Monkai to Dongxing, as well as people. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and um, play that video. <laughs> Is it talking about she is the woman who smuggles people across? Yes. You have to pay the money, of course, to get across. Mm -hmm. So they're experienced in getting people across the border. Yeah, specialized business. And the woman, she is the person who smuggles the people across and the goods across. So they wait for the police not to be there and then they bring the cross. Yeah, they wait for the Chinese police not to be there. So there's not just the woman, but there's another woman who can do it too. Several people she uses for that, yeah. And then a few hours later, what happens? A few hours later, our investigators went on a trip like that, a boat trip. So we're going to see them actually crossing the border right here? Yes, they're going to cross the border from Mongkai to Dongxing. So there you see China. So it looks, what, about 20 meters across? Yeah, very, very short boat ride. Very bad with distances. This is one of the boats that they're getting onto? Correct. And right now we're in Vietnam and across the river that's China? Yes. And it appears that there's some uh, structures there, tent-like structures there. What are those? Those are restaurants lining the riverfront in China. Yeah, that board is also moored on the Chinese side, so that not just now landed. So we're now landing on China. Yes. They just simply get out in broad daylight. Yep. It does look like there's some barbed wire. Yeah, but it's not enough to keep them outside, as you will see. It's very easy to get into China here. If you have the upper body strength of that guy, <laughs> it is. Yeah. Some other people need help here. And now they're in China. Yes. All right. Um, did there come a time that the investigators shared a meal with this individual, this woman, point, uh, person of interest number 28, who just 
to remind everybody, was the younger cousin of an individual that we met in Nikkei. Yes. All right. Did they share a meal with her? Yes, they had lunch with her. And in summary, can you tell us what are some of the things that were discussed during that uh, meal? Yeah, during this meal, she discussed uh, how it's possible that uh, people in Nikkei conduct this uh, illegal trade so easily. Um, so she's going to discuss the, the corruption in the context of the trade in Nikkei. Okay, so um, if we could go ahead and play that video. <laughs> So they're not displaying it there, but in Nikkei, they're all happy to display it. Yeah, as we've seen as well. And they charge money. Is that just, are they she talking about bribery? Yes, I would think so. Okay. So at this point, we've gotten up to October of 2015, and these are the first three field visits. I'd like to now focus on some of the, um, the hard work, the, not, the less glamorous work, the, uh, the analysis and internet research that was done. Um, first, I know that there were a lot of photographs that were taken in connection with these first three field visits. Let's take a few of them to get a better understanding of the nature of the trafficking that took place in Nikkei. So I want to focus first on marketing. Let's go to 6.01.1. All right, now I want to focus in first on the sign on the right um, of this shop. And it appears there's a shop and there's a display and this is an open street in Nikkei. So, if we could pull up the English translation of a number of these, and that's 6.01.2. And we see that openly in Chinese, it appears to be um, advertised as ivory, agarwood, and rosewood. Yes. All right, if we could go to 6.02.1. We have a yellow awning here. It's a little tough to see, but it looks like a number of Chinese characters. Um, and we've had that translated as well. If you could tell us what those characters depict. As you can see, they depict uh, several products, including ivory, agarwood, tiger, rosewood, and rhino horn. Okay. Now, in the course of your investigation, did you also make efforts to analyze some of the telephone numbers that you were able to gather from the photographs? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, uh, what we did here was uh, using the video footage that was taken uh, in July during the first field mission. Uh, we took screen grabs to understand what, as here, like in this case, what was being advertised in all of these shops. And we also looked at phone numbers that we found on the awnings of these shops in order to possibly identify other individuals also involved that we hadn't identified before during the field missions. And, and approximately, without holding you to it, approximately how many photographs did you end up looking at? A lot. A lot, okay. That's, yeah. that's a good approximation. <laughs> uh, so actually, let's focus on one or two of them. Let's go to 6.03. Now, I notice in this photograph, uh, some things have been blacked out. Um, was that done by the Wildlife Justice Commission? Yes, this okay. was done for the purpose of this public hearing. All right, and so it's blacked out to conceal the rest of the um, number. Yes. But you have access to the full number, is that correct? That's correct. I, I want to focus on the one that says 905 at the end, and this is an, on an awning open to the street, correct? Correct. All right, so what research, if any, did the investigation conduct with respect to that particular phone number? We uh, used our WeChat application to see whether this phone number was uh, a known number in WeChat, and indeed it was. So we connected with this phone number using the WeChat app. Okay, and if we could pull up 6.04, we see that number listed here. Yes. All right, and this WeChat number, um, I'm sorry, this WeChat account is assigned to which person of interest? That's person of interest number 23. All right, and can you tell us um, effectively what that person ends up doing? Um, well, we discovered that she uh, was using WeChat to advertise illegal wildlife products. 
Okay, and then let's pull up 6.05. What's depicted here? This is another WeChat profile page of another individual, namely person of interest number 17, uh, who was referred to us by person of interest number five. And just to remind everybody, person of interest number five, where did we first see her? In the video made by Carla Mann in 2012. Okay, and then we saw her again in 2015 during the first field visit. Yes, correct. And her premises, we've called that one PNK4, is that right? That's right. All right, um, you mentioned WeChat, and frankly, before we started working on this, I'd never heard of WeChat, um, but it appears to play a prominent role among this group of traffickers. Could you describe the research that the Wildlife Justice Commission did in order to investigate their activities on WeChat? Yes, for each of the individuals that we identified and that we had phone numbers for, uh, we would uh, look up those phone numbers in WeChat, and if they were, connected to WeChat accounts, we would connect with them in order to understand if they were using WeChat to conduct illegal wildlife trade. Okay, so let's pull up 6.03, I'm sorry, 6.06, .06, which I believe is a compilation of WeChat chats. Um, and if you could walk us through uh, what, what is depicted here. Yeah, before we start, I would like to say that Please these are images... Yeah, images advertised by this same person of interest number 17, who is actually an interpreter. Uh, but we, ca we, came we came to understand that she is also heavily involved in advertising wildlife products, and she explained that she was doing that for her friends. Okay, so this is, a, this is essentially her WeChat profile. It's a video walking through her WeChat page, um, uh, showing things from June of 12th, June 12th to 9th of November of 2015. And then we've added subtitles onto this so that you can see the English translation from the Mandarin. So why don't we go ahead and play this? Here's a rhino horn on a scale. What are these? Five uh, bear bile bladders, dried bear bile bladders. What's that? That appears to be a rhino horn cup. And once again, a rhino horn on a scale. Those appear to be ivory chopsticks. And more rhino horn, slices of rhino horn. Ivory bangles. And as you can see by her language, she's very clearly advertising and trying to sell these items to a Chinese audience because it's all in Mandarin. It's all in Mandarin, right? Yeah. Looks like tiger teeth? Yes. There's a caliper behind it? Yeah. What is that? Those appear to be rhino horn offcuts. So it's actually the rest product of uh, the proce processing of rhino horn products. More rhino horns. That's what? It's advertised as dried tiger testicles. And rhino again. And this person is making a lot of money on WeChat. So just the rhino horn she advertised uh, uh, amounts up to over 1.6 million US dollars. But in total, in the one year that we uh, monitored her illegal trade, uh, she trafficked over 2.1 million US dollars in illegal wildlife products. Okay. So let's go to, if this one's done, let's go to 6.03. I'm sorry, 6.07. Um, before we play this video, can you walk us through what's to be expected when we go through this? Yes, this is an audio conversation we had with another subject, person of interest number 31, uh, who was identified quite late in that first part of our investigation, namely in December. And he was quite informative about how he smuggles uh, ivory products into China and how, how the, the financial aspects of that are organized. Okay, so let's go ahead and play this video. Hey, hello. You in Vietnam? Where are you? You can deliver to Fujian in China. Yes. Oh, I can send to Fujian. If you want to buy it, 
我跟你交互，我跟你交易的，你定金我一点钱，啊啊，后送大福建，你你拿货，你看货，你看完钱给一个发货。Yes. More beads. 还有，你有象牙的原料吗？整整只的原料？原料呃，一堆一堆，你这你用一堆一堆，还是原料你跟料你你拿回你做东西？我刚刚给你发那个。That's a rhino horn. Yes. 呃，那个秋秋这个秋秋好多嘛？你你想几百条？有几百条嘛？呃，秋秋跟手上有几百条，有几百条嘛？哎，我刚才看到你朋友圈里面发了虎骨啊，你怎么卖啊？一公斤多少钱呢、啊？我卖完一套啊，呃，一套有十十几的，十几的几公斤的，卖一按公斤的，一公斤五五千几公斤的，这边还没加运费。那我有中国账号啊，但是等等一下，我问那个运费这种东西运费能不能便宜点？啊，我今天用这两个，呃，两个我用很多，呃，你看，这个、不是我，这个是那个换钱人的，我有那个换钱人，你打你打钱给他，要百分之八十，什么时候会送到你给，你给完给那个送送货人给发货人的。发货人他保证嘛，他保证，如果货有问题，他给我完整。Tiger bones in a bucket。嗯。我给你退来百分之二十。All right, and and these various photographs, these were all on his WeChat page. Yeah, these are actually images that he shared during the audio conversation. During the conversation. Yes, and、uh, what we did for him as well as for the other subjects that we identified to be active on WeChat. Uh, we documented all of his illegal trade, and、uh, over the one year that we monitored him, he was trafficking over 6.5 million U.S. dollars in illegal wildlife products. Okay, so we have two more videos、uh, to show、um, before the break. And just allow, just allow me, perhaps,、uh, okay. to interject briefly to say, as we do get closer to our first break, perhaps、mm -hmm. I can ask you to find a good moment in your presentation to pause and、Absolutely. allow the panel members to ask any questions they may have. About、Absolutely. the evidence they've heard so far. Absolutely. So we have about just to orient everybody.、Uh, we're getting near to the lunch hour. We have two more videos to show that will be relatively short, and then what we'll do is we'll open it up to questions, both from the director and the and the panel,、um, and then we'll take our lunch break. All right.、Um, I'd like to now show、um, 6.07. Can you orient us with what this is? 6.07. Did I just play that one? We. Just did that.、Yeah. Okay, let's. So I only have one more.、Um, <laughs> 6.08. Then. Yeah, what we're doing here. This is a,、uh, an illustration of、uh, the Facebook account of another person of interest, number 27, who we also identified in that stage of the investigation. And we discovered that this person is particularly active on Facebook, advertising quite significant quantities of ivory, mostly ivory products, as well as raw products. Um, and what we're doing here, we're taking you as a sort of. It's, this is a, a navigation through his Facebook page. Okay, so let's go ahead and play that, and if you could walk us through it as we go, narrate as we go. Yeah. So here it starts with an auction of an elephant bone bracelet with just one ivory bead in it. And what I mean by auction is actually opening up an auction for interested buyers.、Um, If you scroll down, you're going to see that people are starting to bid. 100,000 Vietnamese dong, 700,000 Vietnamese dong, going down. And then there's someone who wins the bid for a 750,000 Vietnamese dong. So this is for an elephant bone bracelet. This is another Facebook post where he's posting raw ivory tusks, placing them on the scale to indicate the weight. More ivory tusks. Six ivory tusks. And this is a video of him just navigating it. One of the investigators、yeah. navigating the page as a way of demonstrating what's there. Yeah, and it's really just a selection of everything we've seen. He was quite prolific. These look to be ivory carvings and more ivory carvings.
And this is just openly on Facebook. All right. And this is something that presumably you could get today. Yes. And is, as this is on Facebook, we're also assuming that he, with this he's targeting more of a Vietnamese or a Southeast Asian audience since there's no Facebook available in China. And once again, for this person, we documented all of the images that he advertised and uh, uh, estimate that he, uh, in one year he advertised a total amount of almost 700,000 US dollars in ivory as well as other wildlife products. Okay, thank you. So, I guess what we'd like to do now is, um, we're getting right near the lunch break, just so folks understand what will happen next, is uh, the director and the panel can ask some questions of Ms. Verhey. Her testimony's not done. Um, we'll pick up with her after lunch as well. We'll probably break in and uh, talk with Barbara, um, I'm gonna pronounce, my Dutch is getting better, but still very bad, Gravendel. How is that? Uh, and then also Tom Milliken, who will be uh, talking about trafficking generally. But for right now, I'll ask if the director or the panel have any questions for Mr. Ms. Verhey. If we can focus on at least the evidence that has been presented so far to try and elucidate that a little bit. Before I come to panel members, or would you, would any of you have a question? Yes, yes please, let's start with you, Mr. Sayan. Thank you, this is automatic. Ah, okay. Well, thank you very much for uh, the presentation. Really uh, gives a lot of details that we had already seen in the map of facts, but here in, this, in the videos are fantastic. Uh, many elements have been uh, mentioned, interpreters, uh, bank accounts, and so on. But uh, the component of corruption has been only very loosely mentioned. No? It is possible that some, something will be elaborated about uh, corruption in the different phases, uh, in, the, in the source, in what we have seen in Vietnam, or eventually in crossing the border, because some mention has been made to bribing authorities. But some more complexities have been found regarding corruption. That's uh, main I, question. I think, I think at this point the evidence has shown that there were discussions about with, with the various individuals, for example, the younger cousin talked about um, how you could bribe officials to get across the border, to essentially look the other way, either to cross the border um, through legitimate routes or through the, um, or through, um, to look the other way while they're crossing the river. I think one of the earlier uh, subjects in one of the videos talked a little bit about uh, why it is the interpreter, the first interpreter 16, why it is that they chose Nikkei versus other locations because they're, at least the suggestion, nobody ever says we're bribing people, but the suggestion is, is that it's safe because uh, people are being paid. Um, Ms. Verhey, did you, and obviously we'll see more as the day goes on, but Ms. Verhey, anything else also spring to your mind of the evidence we've seen so far about corruption? Uh, well, I think you summarized it quite clearly. Uh, it's correct uh, that uh, we don't have actual evidence of corruption. We've just had uh, people talking about how there's bribery taking place. So I would say, yeah, I would summarize those as there being indications, quite strong indications, as we'll see later on as well, that there's others discussing this issue. One thing that you won't see in the course of the investigation is the investigators actually having discussions with government officials and paying bribes. Uh, we did not do that. It was all focused on posing as buyers and really the, the way it seems to operate from the evidence we've seen is, is that the sellers themselves were buying protection and access to routes through corruption. Of course, we didn't necessarily have transparency into them actually doing it, but certainly the fact that it's all so open and the fact that they're so easily able to get it across the border certainly does suggest that corruption might have been involved. And also, just to follow up on this point and the, the point raised by Mr. Sayan, I think what struck me uh, looking at one of the videos is just how easy it was for traders to cross that very short border to cross essentially the river. And what also struck us, I believe, is the, the, the lack of presence of customs officers. I mean, do we conclude that they were, for the most part, simply not there? In addition to the fact that they were easy to bribe, uh, a question for Pauline Verhage, and just uh, also on the online uh, uh, trafficking uh, trade aspect of it. So much of it happens, as you say, uh, on WeChat, which is a China-based uh, 
yes, social website. Yeah. I wonder, during the course of your 12-month investigation, to what extent did you notice, how much was there an indication that the authorities were actually cracking down on some of these traders and shutting down some of these accounts, which are there for everyone to see, given the fact that the Chinese authorities, you've said, have, and we heard from the evidence, have far stricter and more enforceable rules, obviously, than their Vietnamese counterparts. Yes, well, we haven't seen any indication of authorities cracking, cracking down on the illegal trade on social media at all during our investigation. As a matter of fact, while uh, we saw a development in Nikkei where trade was becoming, going more underground uh, on social media, it was just as, as clear and open as ever. So some kind of contradictory uh, yeah. uh, message. And that also allowed us to, to understand that the trade was ongoing. Another question for one of our panel members, perhaps. Yes, uh, once again, congratulations uh, for all the information provided. Now, usually I was going to address the public sector corruption network protection, but my colleague has addressed that first. But usually you also have, in cases like this, a private sector a corruption network protection within the financial sector, the banking sector. Uh, we've seen bank accounts uh, detailed. Uh, do you have any further information other than that? Patterns of deposits, the way that the, the modus operandi of which, how that money arrives to the banking sector? I, I, I could say that the investigation, at least that I, of the material I've seen, did not focus on that. I agree that certainly if I were back in my old job as a prosecutor and I were a prosecutor, say, in Vietnam or China, probably the first thing I would do is cut a subpoena and try and get that bank account information. As I said in my opening, it, it was quite compelling to me that you're doing this illegal trade, which is quite massive. Mm -hmm. And at least in my experience, if this was New York City, I would be doing it in cash. Uh, that's what I would expect to see. The fact that they're doing it with reputable banks. One of these banks is the largest bank in the world. Yeah. And, and they're receiving cash in order to buy or in order for, as payment for wildlife traffic products. But go ahead, Ms. Verhey. Uh, well, <laughs> you took the words out of my mouth, I think. Uh, yeah, we weren't, since, since we're an NGO, we don't have the authority, obviously, to go into these bank accounts. But as Mr. Ausner says, that would be the first thing that authorities should do, really, to understand the quantity and who is receiving what and where it's going. And to you understand also to, the illicit financial flows. You also have to keep in mind that uh, up, into, uh, up until October, this was all under cover. Now, there were certainly um, efforts to reach out to the Vietnamese, but you know, if you reached out to the banks and then they shut down these bank accounts, then um, that would f close off some of the avenues of completing the investigation. Yeah. The, the branches are all the same all the time? There's a concentration of branches for each of the banks? Or There's different also... banks being used. Mm -hmm. but, uh... <coughs> As I understand it, they're Chinese banks, not Vietnamese banks, is yes. that correct? Yeah. So that requires reaching out to the Chinese government rather than reaching out to the Vietnamese that's, government. That's correct. And we'll talk about the reaching out to the Chinese government in a moment. Um, I've got uh, just a couple of points of information I want to clarify. Um, in one of the earlier slides, we had just over 1,000 kilograms of rhino horn valued by the WJC at $42 million. And then later on, we saw a clip in which rhino horn was being sold in a shop or hawked in a shop for $29,000 for a kilogram, which would be roughly $29 million if it was a thousand kilograms. So there's a discrepancy there in between the actual, your projected value of a thousand kilograms and what we actually saw on the, saw on the film. And I just wondered um, uh, whether, whether you have any, uh, any comment on that discrepancy. I'll just go through, I've got three questions. Um, and, uh, I think the one thing needs clarification. You also mentioned, Mr. Asner, at, at that stage, that three kilos of rhino horn, uh, uh, that one only need to sell three kilos of that rhino horn to, uh, to buy a Mercedes. Um, but of course, that 29,000 is not pure profit. You're right. That 29,000 represents a whole chain of value coming from Africa through to Vietnam. I think it's important to clarify that. Um, 
And uh, I, uh, two other questions. I wondered whether uh, investigators at any stage bought anything, bought any of these illegal products, or whether they witnessed or filmed a purchase and the handing over of money and goods at any stage. That's the second question. And the third question, purely point of information. When they're speaking Chinese, does anyone know whether they're speaking Cantonese or Mandarin or Fujianese or, or Shanghainese? Um, uh, I'm just trying to get a sense of where the buyers are coming from okay. and where the wholesalers in so China. So let's, let's, let's break that up, and I'll, I'll take the uh, mea culpa on the first mm -hmm. one. My off-the-cuff calculation was a little weak. Uh, <laughs> forgive me. Um, but let's go to, could you describe for the panel, uh, and that was regarding the Mercedes, so it would probably be five rhino horns or six, uh, but uh, I, I would like to say that math was my exactly. was not my strong point, but my background was in math, so... Uh, I blame jet lag. Um, so could you, uh, Ms. Verhey, talk a little bit about um, how this calculation was done um, with respect to the 42.7 million of the rhino that we observed? Yes, well, I, have, I haven't done those calculations myself, and I have a similar problem with numbers as you do, um, but I'll try I to explain. <laughs> uh, what we did firstly, there's, uh, we had the raw products and the processed products. So there's the raw horns and there's the, the, the teacups and the, the bracelets and the, the bangles, uh, what have you. Uh, both for rhino horn uh, and ivory, we looked at all the raw products and uh, those basically we uh, um, took the price that we got in that shop actually, so the 29,000 US dollars per kilogram. So we converted because many of these items, as you see, were placed on scales. So that allowed us to also understand the weight of those items. And then when there weren't items that were weighed on scales, we looked at similar items that had been placed on scales by other traders or by the same trader in order to get an average weight uh, and average price for uh, all of the processed products. Um, and then we looked at the average value that was uh, quoted to us by these uh, traders. So we didn't take the high value or the lowest value, but the average value. And uh, that resulted in this quite conservative estimate. We think it's a very conservative estimate. The, the illegal value is probably much higher than this. But I, but I think it's fair to say that um, we can talk to the, the investigators and before you deliberate, provide you with the calculation backup so you understand this. It's important for you to understand it. I think this, at least the third question, and then hopefully I'll say the third question and remember the second question. Um, the, the third question was the language that they're speaking, uh, whether, which dialect of Chinese, whether it's Mandarin, Cantonese, Fujianese, et cetera. Do you know? Mandarin. Mandarin. Okay. It's Mandarin. Yes. All right, and then this, the, the second, I believe, was um, did the investigators make any purchases during the course of the investigation? No, we did not. Out of principle, we don't want to contribute to illegal wildlife trade. And, and did they w w witness any purchase, any exchange of goods, any exchange of money? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest, to be really honest. But it was quite clear that the Chinese buyers, that they, the Chinese individuals that they did encounter in all of these shops were clearly interested in purchasing products. And, and one thing to notice, I mean, one way you handle that, if, if you were doing, say, a narcotics sting operation or a narcotics operation, you would make the purchases um, and that would give you the credibility so that you could come back and make additional purpose, uh, purchases. What happened here is because of that, the Wildlife Justice, because they weren't making purchases, the Wildlife Justice Commission sent in with each field mission different sets of undercover operators. And interestingly, um, normally when you're dealing with the illegal goods, it takes some time to get credibility with the sales folks. Uh, you work up, you start small and work your way up just like in the movies. Um, but here, with the use of the interpreters who already could pave the way, they were able to get to fairly significant access just showing up. If there aren't any more questions, yeah, yeah. one from Justice Leonardo. There will be a session around the authenticity of these products, but on the ground, could the investigators um, from the expertise know that these were authentic products? And Paulino kept using the word, it appeared to be. Clarify that for me. Um, yes, our investigators that we send to the field uh, are often quite well versed, understanding of uh, uh, wildlife trade as a topic. Uh, so they were able to, for example, for ivory, as an example here, this is quite clearly uh, a tusk from an elephant. 
But when it comes to ivory products, and this is all going to be discussed later, uh, ivory can be di uh, discerned by the lines that are going through the material, the so-called Schrager lines, but that's something for another expert witness. Um, and the same goes for rhino horn and the uh, tiger parts that they observed. And, and that's actually one of the questions I had as well. Um, and we're going to be talking to, to Dr. Gravendale uh, a little bit later, and she'll explain it. Um, and it turns out that you can do fairly well just visually through the photographs. Uh, keep in mind, though, you know, we're not proving this beyond a reasonable doubt. What we're doing is uh, laying out that these are items that are at least offered for sale purporting to be ivory, purporting to be rhino horn and, and tiger bones, etc., and it sure looks like them. Are there any more questions from the panel? I'm sure we'll have many more uh, in the hours to come as uh, Mr. Asner fleshes out uh, more of the arguments and, and we hear more of the uh, witness accounts and the evidence uh, that represents much of the, the map of facts. I think it's a good time perhaps for all of us to pause. We invite you all to join us for lunch and we will all meet back here in one hour as we resume uh, our proceedings. See you back then. <laughs>